I love you, I love you, I love that guy, I love that guy. That's what the L in LCO stands for, right? Is Love Circuit Oceania for sure. Either way, look, we've got a beautiful day of League of Legends here on the LCO. Uh, a lot to get through and a familiar face, but a rare occurrence. The man, I found him in the bushes outside, but he's sitting here on the couch. Yeah. How are you feeling? How was Good. the bush? It, it, it was a long stay, the full month, but I'm glad to be back here. I'm glad they let me back inside the studio. So yeah, keen for a good night tonight. Did you make it like a little home or did you just I like... did, I got a bit of a tarp set up because yep. it like rained a couple of days. So that was a bit that was a bit rough, but yeah, all worked out in the end, mate. Beautiful. What about you guys? Did you enjoy yesterday? Did you get rested, ready for another best of three today? I mean, very ready for a best of three today. I feel like it was a bittersweet day yesterday with how it ended. So I'm looking forward to a best of that has a conclusion, Mac, uh, mm. particularly with our teams playing today. Ooh. The teams playing today, of right. course, might not be playing anymore because if they lose, they're gone. But look, before we get into that discussion, let's have a quick look back at yesterday's games, all the occurrences and all the sick plays before we jump into today. He's going to try and disengage, still caught in the grasp of that hook. Oh, Shoved away, old. he's the to survive. Bayonet keeps him alive just a little bit longer, but not enough to survive that much more. A double kill for the uh, Darius, who's now got a triple, so bleed stacks like you would not believe. As Violet. Oh, great flash away, dodging at the grand entrance as Akano comes in now. Instant polymorph though, just sways his idea of trying to find that kill onto Appy, but still they persevere. Stun passive connects, Appy living as long as he can, making sure that it is voiced to pick it up. Now I'm excited, looking for a second. Chompers go out, but Shunfai's oh, in trouble. Two men knock up this time, Shunfai has to turn around. He can't find oh, it. Violet. Look how low are. Violet, one, two, He's three. got two. No way. If Chief's looking for a potential collapse here, but Raze might be the one that gets caught. Raze does have cleanse, has the ultimate as well, brings the feathers down and snaps back to find one. Make it a second. Retribution found on the other side of the river and the fight continues. And Ground Zero may have just overstayed their welcome. Crazy scenes, crazy scenes on the rift yesterday. Also, you know, the unfortunate technical issue which we had to get past as well. Uh, it was really sad because Grand Zero were playing really well. Fortunately, they get to make up for it today, of course. They're going up against Kanga and they already took a game off of Chiefs yesterday. So you would expect their stonks to be rising at the moment. Yes, you would expect today to be actually a very interesting one to look at on paper because mm. last week we would have looked at this game and said potentially a three game best of series, but based off earlier this week's performances, Maybe it is very one-sided towards Ground Zero. Could go any which way. Let's have a quick look at the bracket before we jump on into too much discussion about it. Uh, this is what has happened so far in the group stage this week. Uh, Diewolves, of course, got that buy win. They're going to be playing PGG next Monday. Uh, moving down, PGG did kind of just completely stomp on Mammoth. It was it was not a very close game, but Mammoth knew it, and now they are going. Oh, they went down to the lower bracket. They get that buy. So they're jumping into lower bracket round two. So we don't get to see them play until later on next week. But we do get to chat with them at the end of the day today. Uh, let's jump into group B. You know, Max, anything to say about what's going on here at the moment? Were you expected how good Team Bliss looked coming into the group stage? Definitely, they definitely surprised me with how dominant they're looking. I think Team Bliss versus Chiefs is actually shaping up to be quite a close series going off recent form, right? If we are looking at Chiefs last night dropping a game to Ground Zero, mm. I think that this series will actually be a lot closer than originally expecting on paper. And I think Kanga Ground Zero also is sort of the same thing. I think in terms of team strength going into the start of the split, definitely next to each other in the standings. But like Rusty said, I mean, Ground Zero had a really strong showing tonight and Kanga sort of haven't demonstrated that same level of improvement for me. So they're definitely going to need to pull something out of the bag if they want to continue in the league. Yeah, of course, that game we are going to be watching today is this lower bracket game, the first of a couple. And it is going to be one of these two teams going home, getting knocked out of the tournament and going out in that seventh position. So uh, it will be very sad to see one of these teams go because I feel like it's been such a short split so far. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ground Zero starting to really find their feet though, moving into this lower bracket, it's getting very dangerous for Kanga. I mean, the truth is, Mac, it has been a short split, right? Like, mm -hmm. last season of the LCO was a triple round robin into those eliminations, which is what, 21 games each before we actually send someone off. Yep. We did a single round robin, they've now played a single best of three, got 2 0 and now they're at the precipice of being eliminated, so it is a lot faster this time around to make MSI. Absolutely insane scenes there, but also, Exclamation Dreamhack in the chat, please, because 
you know, we are going to have some LCO action down at DreamHack. That's, of course, going to be on the Saturday, April 29th. Uh, so make sure you don't miss it. Get a ticket for that day in particular. But if you want to not miss out on all the other action going on, you know, get a three-day pass because it's going to be a good weekend. Last DreamHack was insane. Everyone here was there. We had a great time. Everyone we spoke to there had a great time. I just didn't hear too many complaints about it. And it's all happening again at the end of April. Yeah, you talk this time. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've responded to everything. It's your no, turn. Well, the only thing I was um, <laughs> just looking at is just if we actually go back to the other camera for two seconds, just look at how tall Max is compared to Mac. <laughs> Look at, but look at the width, bro. The width is all that matters. Like, look at the width of those shoulders, bro. I'll I'm sit like, back. I'm like half the size. If I sit up, anyway. if I erect my spine, oh, we're oh. almost the same height. But then when we stand next to each other, he's got the leg length. We've so. got a couple of eagles over here spreading their wings, eh? Far <laughs> out. It was back there yesterday, so we still got a little <laughs> so. Look, Either way, uh, I have to have something on him. I don't have the height, I've got the width. That's what it's all about. But look, uh, it's, we're, not, we're talking about Dream Act. How did this happen? Well, that's what I'm here for. That talk. is what I'm here for, mate. <laughs> I'm talking about, yeah, we had a great time at DreamHack, pop. didn't we? Oh, but if you look at these guys, they're jacked. If you come to DreamHack, you can take a photo between these two absolute snacks. That's where you were going yeah. with it. Of course. We get to see you there. And we get to take photos. Uh, look, <laughs> let's get back on the discussion of League of Legends. Uh, make sure you get those tickets, though. Exclamation DreamHack in the chat. We are going to be having a quick look at a few champs from 13.3. Their presence, the, the main ones picked around the world. Skimmy, this is a stat. This is a graphic that you wanted up here. Yeah, so, just a bit of a mean? highlight, really, of sort of, you know, where the rest of the world is putting their priority on this brand new patch. I think no surprises for a lot of people is the double AP junglers and the likes of Maokai and Elise. Insane presence, 100% for the Maokai in particular, right? Really, really strong here for the early game, the tankiness, the damage overall, just really snowballing the game to a point by 15 minutes. Very hard to recover. Obviously, Ash support is coming to the fold of things. Really oppressive to try and deal with, especially in this double AD carry bot meta. Um, and with an ultimate that goes down to, what, like 30, 40 seconds, you're just firing those off. You don't really have any conditions to be concerned about. Makes it very difficult for teams to post up in mid lane and siege or, you know, take those turrets as a result. Caitlyn also, obviously a lot of great range. It seems to be a nice, uh, another, you know, reliable uh, response to, you know, the various poke lanes as well. You go to Caitlyn Lux, you're sieging, turret plates fall on down, you snowball once again. Uh, obviously the Jax is incredibly strong since the rework, even stronger in the laning phase when that really hasn't been Jax's um, tendency of old. So the fact that you can spike on a Sheen, Divine Sundra, and you're winning in the 1v1s even before you got those two free item spikes, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily forced to now split push like a Fiora or Camille. You certainly can group up, land these devastating free four-man stuns and sort of win the game. And Lucian Nami is still around. Um, we are obviously seeing a big preference towards, you know, your Varus, um, Varus Ash, you know, your Zeri Yumi, but Lucian Nami is still here to play. And look, Max, you haven't been here with us too often. No. But you've got some strong things. You've got strong arms, you've got a strong jawline, and you've got strong opinions. So tell me about <laughs> what's going on with these chains. Okay, one thing I do want to say that we haven't been seeing up here, but it has seemed high priority, at least from yesterday, is Annie. Yep. Annie, absolutely broken champion on the patch. Um, been playing in support yesterday from Aladoric. We haven't seen it in mid lane yet, but I definitely can be played in that role. And I think it's really interesting because this is sort of one of the picks that our region is sort of experimenting with and seeing how it goes, right? So far, I think it was played into High Medinger as sort of an answer because that lane is pretty oppressive normally, but Annie is a champion who can navigate lanes pretty well. And then she just becomes a menace late game, you know, having that stun, having the shield, which now recently been buffed as well. Just absolutely crazy. I think that this is a pick that's going to be really high priority today and to see how teams sort of go towards it in the draft because it was getting first picked. How much intricacy is there for Annie? Because I feel like she's like one of the first champs you get told to unlock and I mean, play. Yeah. And it's, it's very point and clicky. Is there much of a skill ceiling? Because I've noticed like with Vi coming in, with Annie coming in, there's a lot of champs that are excelling at the moment that are like low skill yeah. on paper. But where's the intricacies in these I picks? mean, like, Annie, in terms of, like, things that you need to know besides Tibber's micro, yep. uh, which is fairly straightforward. Like, you play a couple games Annie, you would get the gist of it. It's just knowing how to manage your stun, right? Knowing how to manage your mana. Uh, and because you're a support, Annie, in a lot of these cases, it's about using mana correctly and not running out. Uh, and realistically sitting at, you know, three out of four on the stun bar so that you have a spell in the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really it. There's not much beyond that in terms of intricacy. Annie is a cheap champion for a reason, right? It's because you just press tippers and win. Well, that's like, that's why I play Shivana because I just don't have to worry about mana, you know? Mm. It's just unlimited resources. You know, never back, never base, don't need it. Either way, look, uh, from the fans, you guys at home, I'm sure you've got some favorite champs and probably some favorite champ skins as well. Now, we want to hear what your favorite legendary League of Legends skin is. Hashtag LCO on the Twitter sphere to get those submissions in. But also, 
we were having a discussion as to what tier Legendary is, what even are <laughs> Legendary even skins. Sure. So please just send in any Legendary skin, even if it's not your favourite, so we know which skins are Legendary, because we don't want to Google it. And we've got a couple of submissions to have a look at as well. So let's see what your favourite ones are. And who sent them in? Oh. Coach Ash. Oh, what's this one called? Gentleman Cho'Gath, and this, in hey. terms of voice lines, probably the best skin in the game. The, the like, up you go, and all the lines he has is just one of the greatest skins you'll ever see. I there's um, something about this chair where suddenly you just develop an English accent, isn't it? <laughs> he does have an English no, accent. Skin does okay. have an English that was, accent. But that's what I'm saying, but Kitty does the English accent in that exact spot. Now Max oh, is doing it as well. <laughs> yeah, spelt see, wine. it's infectious. Can you imagine if it was not Gentleman Cho, but it was like Chav Cho, and he's just like, oh, I'm going to absolutely <laughs> knock you up in it, bruv. <laughs> oh man, that is a legendary skin right there. We need to get you on the phone to Riot <laughs> ASAP. <laughs> just mog Cho. I've wow. just mogged you, mate. Mog Gaff. <laughs> no, but Look, this, is, this is a I'm very <laughs> refined skin choice, a gentleman's skin. Yes. I'm going to let that idea stew for just, just a second while we have a look at another submission over here. But thank you, Ash. TN's in a bum bag, I got a Cho Gaff. We got Mr. Harris, <laughs> Big Dave Harris uh. Oz on Twitter Sphere. Alien Invader, Heimer, the best I have on my shelf, but Corporate Mundo, the undisputed goat, with bonus marks for the Skimmy and Zed rendition of it on air. Oh, oh I understand Mundo. it now. Yes, when I when I um, dressed up as the Corporate Mundo, when we had um, yes. guests on the, what was it, it was the B-Teamo, we had... Shaco. Shaco from Shaco. Tubes. What were you playing? I wasn't Oh, no, there. you weren't no, on it, that's there. right, and we had Nat T as a Moomoo. I remember that. Yeah, I could have cosplayed cool. like that one. See, I didn't know that. Bunny looking. It's true. I mean, move existed. Uh, look, either way, we've Good got a few too. more to have a look at. Yeah, that was that had the red red uh, diamond square on its side. Not tight. Not quite a diamond, but <laughs> is it a diamond if it's still <laughs> every? Are you every... referencing the legendary gem? Yeah, <laughs> that's the skin indicator so the of the red ones, rarity. Yeah, yeah. The red ones are the legendary ones. Yeah, I got a couple of those. I don't know how to check them on my phone or yeah, anything. I don't have a computer yeah, here. Either. Yeah, look. Either way, uh, I'm glad I figured out. Um, Lengths and angles and yep, sides, squares. Uh, okay, if you were looking at these skins and you didn't know which champion it's the it same was, picture. would you be able to tell which <laughs> champion that is? <laughs> left Akali on the left, Akali, Vladimir yeah. in the middle. It's and not Vlad. That's not Vladimir, is it? Uh, no, it's just the same as one of the Vlad skins. It's not Vlad. And is it a Syndra? Because she's holding an I would have thought Lux on the right, eh, without. Are they in order? Is the text to the Are image Relia in order? On the right? No, it can't be. I can't, you're right. The last, one is is the last one is Kaiser, I swear. Kaiser? Because that's Maybe. from TFT. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's What's a Kali, Diana, Kaiser from left to right. Oh, wait, it literally says it underneath the picture. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's either SG Kaiser, SG Kali. They're not, they're they're not in order. Oh, okay, they're yeah, in yeah, order. Yeah. But is that not Diana? Wait, which one's Diana? The one on the right? Well, the Kali's the one that does flips, right? Middle one's Diana. They are in... <laughs> No, they're not in order. No, no, they're not in order. They're not in order. <laughs> they're so, so smart. They are so smart. I just, oh. <laughs> no matter how bad we are at detecting these, they are great skins. Oh, I'm going to yes. I'm that gonna let you all in a secret. I usually have a coffee before the broadcast. I didn't today, and I think it's showing. So, uh, look, we've got much more of this funny stuff going down You're gonna need my brain. But, Mac, with there is a dare ice coffee. Look, we'll get to that. We'll okay, get to that at some point. <laughs> nice uh, try. But look, okay. let's move the discussion away joke, from eh? Max's jawline and into the game. <laughs> We're here to watch as well. Let's talk about Grand Zero first. Max, you haven't been here too often. You've been out the front in the bush for a month. Mm -hmm. But tell me, have you watched the games and what have you liked from Grand Zero? I absolutely have. Haven't liked Bulldog's haircut that much, but uh, the gameplay has been absolutely great. Like, I think that the level up that they've shown from the start of the split where they just looked like an absolute shaky mess, no direction whatsoever. To coming in versus the Chiefs, it was very clear that they had a game plan, both in terms of draft and how they were actually executing in game. And I think particularly the one person I wanted to call out in particular is Gooby, right? He was so shaky at the start of the split, didn't really seem to fully want to commit to any plays. But yesterday on his Viego, counter jungling, his Vi engages in the game of their one versus Chiefs were incredibly decisive, pulling the trigger and securing them the five wins. So I think that this team, if they continue the form that they showed yesterday, are definitely going to be a hard challenge for Kanga to get around. And look, I'm going to let you breathe for a second while we look at the Kanga roster because I'm going to ask your opinion as well. I don't care about theirs. We've heard their opinion all the time. You're a fresh face. Yeah, this is great. So breathe quickly. This. One, two, three. Hope you got your oxygen. Tell me about Kanga. Uh, okay, so Kanga is sort of a similar story in terms of they're a young, young, inexperienced team. But I think that they haven't really shown the same level of improvement throughout the split, right? They've sort of seemed the exact same since when they started. And I think a lot of that is just the lack of team cohesion, right? I think in a lot of games, they're making individual mistakes in lane. 
particularly the bot lane, right? Hooper was hyped up as his big talent from order, and I still think he is. I still think he has the mechanical ability to be able to pop off. But I don't think there's any leader in the team that's calling those plays and allowing him to get to that stage, right? It always seems like they fall apart before they're ever able to get to the team fighting stage. And I think that mm -hmm. they are going to need to be a lot more cohesive and a lot more stable in that early game if we are going to see them put up a fight against Ground Zero. And you got to remember as well, when Fido came into Kanga in the previous split, he was that shot caller that managed to get the success for Kanga and take them into the playoffs. But look, here we are, a newer roster, less experienced players around him. And we were having a discussion before as to like why this wasn't working as well as it did last split. And Rusty, you were saying, you think it's just because Fido's trying to force his champ pool into the meta rather than adapting to the champs that are meta. I think one of the factors is that Fido has a very set champion pool, right? Yeah, and yeah. it has shown with the a series earlier in the week. Yeah, now it is a little bit thicker. Uh, he has added some meta champions in. For me, I actually want to compare this current Kanga to the Direwolves that we saw last year. Mm -hmm. uh, because the Kanga that made playoffs last split had Benvy, you know, had people in there that can be shot callers. But if Fido is the primary voice in this current Kanga squad, Zoranus is a great example of someone who had to spend more time communicating than he did mechanics maxing, right? And now Zoranus comes into this split, doesn't have to shot call as much, and he's been unleashed, where it feels like perhaps Fido has been more shackled, right? Has to spend more time communicating with his team, which means less time focusing on himself, mm -hmm. and those unique champions that he have has aren't being as effective. Which is a little bit sad, because I was really enjoying everything we got from Fido last split last year. You know, he came in, had Benvy, had Lemas down in that bot lane, which we were talking in the interviews, everyone else is saying, look, this bot lane coming through from Team Bliss is starting to look like one of the better bot lanes in the league at the moment. And Fido's lost that. Yes, he's got Hoop, yes, he's got Shinky. But the question is, what can he do with them? Because they have one game remaining. Technically, look, that's one series remaining, two games remaining. At, le at least. At least. At, at least. least. Bare minimum. Yeah, I think the big thing that I would like to see, and I guess this sort of goes back to your Fido point as well, is Fido giving direction to Mayfun. Because from what I've seen in a lot of these games, it sort of seems like Mayfun is a bit lost, right? And that can happen when you're playing on a team where, you know, mistakes are happening in lane, just sort of getting pulled in every which way, and you don't really know where to go and where to commit your resources. I'd love to see in this series Fido be like, hey, we're going here, we're making a play, just follow me and sort of him be that captain, be that experienced veteran yeah. and really go for it, right? Well, because if he just runs around the map, Kango just going to lose. Think about that one win, right? Like what was yeah. he playing? He was playing Rise. He was literally dragging Mayfun around on the yeah. Umumu and that was where they were successful. They certainly were. And someone that has had so much success, especially with finding the right barber, is Bulldog. Let's bring him in for the pre-match, mate. Hey, oh, oh. Oh, Tough. we're talking about big units. Putting us to shame. I know. What's up, Kurt? Yeah. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for asking. Look, uh, Bulldog, how are you feeling going into this game? Did you get those tech issues sorted? Obviously, yesterday, a little bit sad for everyone involved, in, us included, just watching that. You know, do, do you think that you had Chiefs on the ropes there? Because on social media, they looked like they were. I mean, yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone knows that game three, we kind of draft kingdom. So it is what it is for our outcome of that match, but uh, we should be able to easily 2-0 Kanga. Well, that sort of goes to my next question. Kanga have seemed kind of shaky all split. Do you think that there's anything that you're really worried about on their team? Is there a particular player you know, you guys are cautious of, or is it all easy across the board? Mm, no, nah, I think they're booty cur. <laughs> yeah. but I, 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 I just think they just don't have like, Synergy together, that's all. Like, they're all individually, you know what I'm saying? But they just don't mingle together. That's that's what I think. Okay, now, look. Those issues yesterday, they all sorted. We got the full roster in here today for GZ. Ah, uh, yeah, those issues are sorted. Uh, I think someone from Darwell's gave Dante a PC for backup, so... Shout out to them, I guess. Yeah, beautiful. Well done from them. Now, look, uh, moving into this one. From, did you go back and watch Kanga's best of three series? Were, were you happy with what you saw from them? Do you feel like you've got them in the draft? Because as you mentioned, you had that draft kingdom going on for you yesterday. I mean, yeah, I watched their games. It was, it was, it was interesting. They like had no setup on ejectors and were just running them blind, but it is what it is. Okay, cool. And for yourself, I mean, we saw a really nice Rakan game coming out from you yesterday. Are you looking to play some more of those big, heavy engage hitters? I know you don't want to say too much, but we like seeing you on that. Are you keen to get some more games on stuff like the Rakan in today's series? Uh, well, I mean, 
if I get R5, then obviously I can match and max, I'll match and match like what I can play. Just depends on what we need and what we are versing, to be honest with you. Oh, beautiful. Also, Dante said in the interview yesterday, uh, you lied, you said you feel like a lot of pressure on your shoulders. Uh, I'm exposing Dante right now. A and you said when you guys weren't having a lot of success during the split, you were taking that on yourself. But when I said that to him, he made it seem like you were putting it on them. So is it different behind closed doors? Are you are you okay? Is everything fine? I mean, I mean I'm mean, i Gucci. I'm Gucci. I think the boys were more sad than me about last night's uh, circumstances. So you can take that as it is. Okay, I'll take that and I'll put it in my pocket for next interview. But Bulldog, we're going to let you go. Get ready for the game and good luck today. Oh, thank you. Have a good night. I will. I always do. Especially with Max is here. Such a great time. Look at him, huh? Look at them shoes. <laughs> what are you doing? Look at them. What are you doing, Mark? <laughs> you just got Max much bigger dangerous. feet than Kitty. I don't know. It's just It just got caught me off guard. I was like, wow. <laughs> Crazy. Either way, uh, look, that was. Uh, did you get anything out of that interview? Bulldog was a man of few words today. Well, I saw a lot of flexing, a lot of hair adjusting. <laughs> yep. And he seemed very comfortable. I must very say, clean. his mm. haircut looks a lot better there. Well, and when he has a really headset good on. today. Yeah. yeah. I liked it. <laughs> it covers up the sides where <laughs> there is no hair. You know, it's, did, did you say you didn't like it? No, I didn't like that photo of it. Ah, okay. yeah. Right. I, I thought the photo was fine. I like the, the like oh, the little scruffy. I, I like what he's doing with it. I mean, he owns it, right? That's the most important thing. No matter what the haircut is, exactly. you own it. He's confident. Yeah. Seems like he's in his in his lane and mm. he's in his zone with it. Of course, no real insight into the draft. Of course, he was Nothing. definitely with the poker face there. Yep. Wants this W, but someone else that wants a W is my man Blue, my boy Blue, my man Blue. Blue, how you doing? Yo, what's up? How you guys doing? Good. I'm good. I'm good. Now, look, how are you feeling going into this one? Kanga, of course, uh, it hasn't been a great start to the group stage for you, but what, what's changed since Monday? Honestly, the only thing that changed is that, like, I'm more confident. I feel like I was a bit nervous in the group stage, but, like, now I'm just like, it's whatever. Like, I'm going against my mates. Like, I'm just going to have fun, you know? Now, you've been a very stable laner throughout basically this entire split. And I think across the board, you know, Kanga have just, you guys have had some struggles working synergistically. Is there anything that you guys are focusing on to really improve and, and take the win against Ground Zero? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is like the mental aspect of it. Like, I feel like the attitude we put into scrims and in the actual game is a lot different. So we're just trying to like match the scrim attitude into the game attitude so that we can like play at 120%. Now, yesterday, Grand Zero, of course, pushed Chiefs pretty well. Did you get anything from that game that you're going to sort of comp uh, put into your draft today? Maybe, you know, tailor some of those bands for things you don't want to play that you saw them play yesterday? Yeah, 100%. Like, I saw the game. They were playing well, but we're not nervous at all. We're pretty much confident. We figured out the draft, and hopefully we can win today's game. You talked a bit about nerves uh, earlier on. Does it being an elimination game, does that sort of help? Because I know in some some ways it can sort of be a weight off. You sort of have nothing to lose in a, in a sense. But then again, you could be out of the playoffs entirely. So how are you guys feeling knowing that, you know, if you do lose this series, that could be it? Uh, well, I'm not sure about the rest of my teammates, but me personally, I'm just going in like the same attitude as any other game. Like I'm not that like nervous or worried. Like, yeah, it's just the same for me. Okay, and on that note, Blue, we will let you go, get ready for the game, and good luck today. Yeah, thank you very much. He sounded chill. He sounded pretty collected, you know? A lot of players have sounded chill, and I'm really starting to see the rinse and repeat answers here, Mac, on how are you, and the response is, yeah, good. Mm -hmm. There's chill. There's chill. I wanted the no question, wants to say anything. how did it feel to play Orn when you're a carry player? And he says, oh, mate, it was just this. It was <laughs> just it Fire was my awful. coach. Yeah, fire my entire coaching staff. Yep. Put me on Karma instead. Well, wow. Put me on Karma instead. That is the, not where you go. Low blow. That's, a, that's an even bigger <laughs> fire. <laughs> we want Camille. We do. We want Fiora. We mm. want Camille. Fiora's going to get banned, I guarantee. But Camille? What did you say? Gallio as well? That'd be a little yeah, bit Yeah, spicy. I want Camille Gallio. That'd be nice. We're just leaking all of Kanga's I have, drafts. I have a draft <laughs> in my head that yeah. beats Ground Zero, and we're going to compare it to what Kanga do once we're in Champs League. Well, we'll talk about that afterwards, because I want to hear what that is. But no, leaks... No, no leaks just not. yet. Uh, either way, look, let's have a quick look at the stats between both these teams uh, for the split so far. GZ doing pretty well, of course. Look, uh, much higher win rate 
than Kanga, managing to get a fair few wins towards the end of the split, and also starting to sort of beat all those teams towards the bottom of the table. So they have that going for them. Kanga still trying to figure out what's going on here. And one thing I do want to say is I feel like these stats make Kanga look a lot worse than they are. I think if you look at this and just take it at face value and see an 8% win rate, you're going to be like, well, this team is just sandbagging every game. But I think in terms of actual player skill, there's not that much of a difference. And I think the majority of it does come down to that team cohesion and maybe a bit of mental gap like Blue was talking about. But I really do hope that they can bring it back because mechanically, I think this is definitely a roster that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ground Zero, right? It is just going to be more around that team play. Yeah, I fully agree. I think like if you look in the top lane, for example, I feel like Blue versus Tron is going to be very volatile. I feel like it's a very even field for them to try and exploit. Obviously, last time Tron played the Olaf and had a bit of a um, you know top lane canyon, but I think there's certainly room for Blue to showcase that. You know, Even in that game when he played the Yone, mechanically it was sound. So, so clean on that one. I think Mayfan versus Gooby is an interesting one as well because they definitely can look incredibly strong on a particular champion or a particular style. I think Fido should be looking at this one saying that I am the star of the show and I can absolutely get Emphis on my day. Mm -hmm. And maybe they need to really rally around him. So it could be something global like the Galio, like the Rise, something that allows him to have prior to Rome. Global comps, huh? We love global we comps. We love global comps around here. Look, let's have a quick <laughs> look at who's playing on what side. I think GZ come in with the side select from the highest seed and they've chosen the red side. So it looks like they're going to be able to get the counter pick. Bulldog mm -hmm. did say maybe they saved the ban for him, but you look. When do you save the ban for a support? In what realistic scenario is Are the you support? Going to ask me the support? Yes, the support. Always. Man. Support's the most important comp-based pick. Right, Everything no, else has mind. a blind he's, pick. He's biased. He should five P top lane. But I think. I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, I no think, bias. Think, bias. <laughs> realistic. I played jungle. The last professional games I played yeah. were on jungle. I will say that. It's true. Um, but what I, what I do want to say is that it does come down a lot to draft order. And I think that Tron has shown that he is willing to pick, you know, perhaps a tank earlier yep. in the draft, in which case you just lock Blue's champion. Yep. Sorry, other way around. But you just lock your, your top lane champion and then you just pick your sub five. And I think Dante has shown, I mean, that Zeri game, practically 1v9, right? So yeah. if you can secure a winning bot lane, that can be a really good ticket for Ground Zero to take the game. Okay, and, and what about you, Skimmy? What are you saving your fifth pick for? It's a trick question because you only play ARAM, so you don't even well, get Well, I pick. only play AD carry, and you definitely don't pick AD carry last. So, um, yeah, I would save it for, for, for support, probably. I think the answer actually is support, though, it is. because it's a comp thing, right? Like, you can pick your AD carry early. You pick usually a solo laner into bands, so you're still kind of picking uh, a safe, like, comp pink for that, but that's for your comp. You pick the support to counter their comp or to have a winning like map state overall. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I like Bulldog getting his fifth pick, Rakan, for example. Okay, well, you get your pick. Bulldog might get his pick. Skimmy never gets a pick because the bloody game does it for him. <laughs> but you guys, you have Twitch points, so you can pick where you're putting them for the Dare fan vote. Up there, you have to put them up there. You don't get that choice, but you can choose which team. You know, the button's up there. Press the button. I think, oh, there we go. Now we can do it. Yeah, up there somewhere. Either way, uh, buttons up there, press it, put your Twitch points on. These Ground Zero players, uh, fans rather, are going to have a lot of points because they got bang. Mm -hmm. They got Twitch points stonks yesterday uh, up against Chiefs when they managed to win that one game. But look, let's have a look at our predictions, what we think is going to be going down here in the rift. Uh, it's two zeros on the first page. Skimmy. Has mm -hmm. that red side pick from GZ changed your opinion at all? Or No, I think I think Grand Zero can start to believe their own hype. I mean, both teams have taken a game away from the Chiefs, but the fashion in which um, Grand Zero did in a recency bias as well, I think it was just a little bit too methodical. They had a, a big okay. squeeze on how they approach the, the key carries in the likes of Kisse and Rays, and I think you can definitely look to approach that. If, if Fido and um, Blue are your, your main threats, then you can once again do that same approach, lock them down with CC, target the side lanes, make it very hard for for Kanga to find an avenue back in. Okay, and what about you, Max? You're the only one that's gone two to one. You're giving Kanga a game. Yep. Yeah, I am giving Kanga a game. I think it's the series is very draft dependent in, in my head. And okay. I think that if Kanga have done their prep well, going back to their last series, I wasn't a big fan of the draft. So I've sort of worked myself into a hole with this one. But I do think that if they can get some decent matchups around that mid jungle, not give them, give Ground Zero really easy to execute comps like they had versus Chiefs. I think it is a very even footing. And in that case, you can make a couple mistakes and the game can swing. So I'm going 2-1. I also want to come first in predictions. So True. I need to be a bit different. You, you uh, went three games whilst you're here, obviously. A couple behind. Yeah, I'm losing like a Twitch chat. You're like two behind? I think so. Oh, wait. If you're losing a Twitch chat, you're losing button. Stonks, you're with me and Rusty probably at that point. Uh, I'm losing. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm losing. Well, well, <laughs> do you think that we're going to get 
a good comp or some kind of say cheese. Where's the button? <laughs> that was a way too delayed. <laughs> comp, bro. By the way, uh, champ selects, right champ selects right ready. Oh. We're about to find say out. Say cheese. <laughs> Oh, we're going into draft. Oh, okay. Yes, bro. That literally was the yes, segment bro. switch. We're okay. Kane got the left hand slide with blue slide priority. You have straight away said Olaf. That was a mistake last time. You went nine and one. You won V9, and that will certainly not happen this time. So that's been denied. Same with the Scion as well. And the Fuhrer hasn't been removed away in the first rotation. So I really wonder now, Max, if that is a, a priority in his first three. It is hard to get Fuhrer on blue side, I will say, just because if you are blind picking it, there are a lot of champions that can sort of nullify it and just sort of reduce it to a neutral lane at best. I do think the Scion ban is interesting, right? Because when I look at Blue, he looks like a player who is very comfortable playing into a Scion. A lot of his picks are those sort 100%. of scaling fighters that would like to go up against a tank that doesn't really do much in lane. So that sort of catches me off guard. I wonder if they do have a plan, but there's the Annie we were talking about at the start of the day. Yeah, so the fact that Kanga didn't prioritize that Annie in their first pick does seem to me that they just don't play it. Uh, it does seem to be absolutely the case. Uh, but Grand Zero will get the free pick of that afterwards. Uh, again, with the flexibility that you mentioned at the top of the day, Max, will it go to Emphis? We haven't seen yet, uh, but most likely does go to Bulldog with what we've seen from Oceania. And a Sejuani does lean itself towards melee solo laners uh, yet again. So if you're not careful here as Kanga and you go for the Jace and leave it exposed, you could be dealing with a Renekton and a ganking top lane a Sejuani. Yeah, I don't actually mind this though from Kanga because whilst they have picked both solo laners, there is still a bit of, bit of flexibility, right? Where the Gragas can head towards the mid lane. Same with Jace we saw yesterday from Kise. But you're absolutely right, Rusty. This opens up the opportunity for something like an Aurelia, you know, sort of fine into both matchups. Yeah. Gragas perhaps a bit more neutralizing. I don't know whether Tron or Emphis will play this. And here comes Azeri, you know, for Dante. In terms of comfort picks, in terms of picks that he's proven he can perform on, this has got to be right at the top of that list. Yeah, really did have that 1v9 standout performance, right? 10 kills to his name, not a single death to be matched up against a, a hard carry like Graze is certainly a formidable feat to take on down. Uh, I'm really curious to see, you know, with all the flexible champions in place, right? The fact that we could certainly get an Annie mid, it could be the Annie support with the Zeri, the fact that, you know, a Jace has come out, and I've never seen Fighter play it in his yeah. career. Now, obviously, we know he can play the Tristana, but for me, he's always been that atypical um, AP user. So if they can flex the ability to have a Jace in the mid lane, it opens up a whole new can of worms for me. And for what it's worth, I think we have seen a lot of Vygragas as a combo uh, lately through mid jungle. So when you do see these three champions locked in, you're expecting blue Jace and to have Fido on the Gragas. So yeah. it's kind of like flexible in italics, but not actually going to be flexed uh, specifically for this Kanga composition. And they're also going to go for the Syndra ban fourth, which to me, speaks that they just want to take comfort away from Emphis, not mm. that they're afraid of the Syndra, uh, just to try and really push his champion pool. So maybe it's even a LeBlanc with it. Or even the Ari. Obviously, we saw them find yeah, a lot true. of success with that too, right? Another pick champion. The Maokai obviously is up and available, but both teams completely forgiving and saying we don't care about it. We just want a little bit more engage uh, from, a, I suppose, a, a tankier standpoint, as opposed to having to invest into, you know, First Strike or uh, the Demonic Embrace. What will that final ban be with the Caitlyn and the Karma denied away? They actually go for the GP for Tron too, mm. so heavily targeted. Yeah, and it is interesting to me that they aren't locking in any top lane bans as soon as I say that the Cassante gets picked. Now, this is interesting to me because Cassante into Jace can't really do anything in lane, right? He doesn't have the ability to really get on top of him unless Jace really griefs, and Blue has shown that he is quite stable in lane. So to me, this is just Tron. It's almost a test, right, when you pick Jace. It's like, will the enemy top laner pick something that really wants to kill me with his jungler? And Tron said, you know what? No, I'm just going to pick something that neutralizes the lane. Uh, Gooby, you okay. can go play towards bot lane and snowball the game like that. So I was seeing the the Draven hover into the Varus pick, and I was quietly hoping that it would be the Varus. I just think your composition overall, if you go for a Draven, mm. you have a Jace top when you're playing towards bot, probably running it down at a high pace. Yeah. Especially with the enemy team having a Sejuani. So you spoke about it being difficult for Cassante. That's absolutely true. But, you know, draft skews things heavily. Uh, in saying that, they've gone for the Varus. Most likely we'll get an Enchanter or something of the likes that's safe and can play with the comp. Uh, in that Soraka is where they're going to go. So right now, Jace Varus, high poke, soul magic damage in mid of the Gragas. And I think Kanga have a solid comp overall. Yeah, now this would be interesting, right? Because this would mean that Annie is potentially heading towards the mid lane into what we're assuming is going to be the Gragas. We will wait to see what Bulldog does end up locking in, but this would be, and there it goes. So this is all in on Dante here, right? You look at this comp, very low damage. Annie 
deals, deals a little bit, but against sort of those higher range champions like the Jace, like the Varus, it is going to be really hard for them to close the gap, right? So this is all on Dante saying, you need to get ahead, you need to be absolutely smurfing these team fights if we have a shot of winning. Yeah, it really is a fascinating affair here that has all come down to that one, uh, a lot of eggs in that basket. It almost feels like the narrative is built to say, uh, you know, Dante against the world, but also Fito. Can he look to hit those same highs? I think that's a really valid point you mentioned before, right, about the communication, sort of how you do have to not nullify your skill to a degree, but almost cap it by having to sort of lead um, the rest of the squad to victory. So if nothing else is to change it, and it would have seemed weird if it had been adjacent, it doesn't really fit the bill for him, but the Gregor should have certainly enough sustain to make sure that the Andy doesn't get too far away with it. Yeah, I think this game's going to have a very interesting uh, battle when it comes to ranges and, and team fights more than anything else, right? Because Ground Zero have such great tools to engage in the Sejuani and the Annie, but you also need to make sure that the Zeri is freely hitting through all of this, like you just mentioned before, Max, going to be the primary carry of the team. The enemy squad has a Vi, quite simply have the tools to take you down, but they also have the option of not playing at your range and just sitting back and harassing you and poking you. Now, Ground Zero yesterday, we saw were very good at recognizing fight windows and angles and punishing their opponents. So you really want to see that Ground Zero come in again today so they can find the Varus, right? Find Hooper, find the Jace, and stop them from being able to play the poke game before that Vi goes in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, a lot of disengaged tools actually on the side of Kanga as well, you know, you have the Gragas, you have the Varus ultimate, you have the Soraka, all the champions that want to peel back, right? And if the Varus does mm -hmm. up towards that lethality, then, you know, you've got Jace, you've got Varus, even if he goes non lethality he's still offering a fair decent bit of poke, and the Gragas, and so it is going to really come down to ground zero to be able to pull that trigger and on Gooby once again, and sort of the soul engage, right? Because Kasante, you know, potentially coming from a flank here, but in a straight five on five standstill, it really is that Sejuani ulti that's going to be starting off these fights. Who do you think then has the better ease of execution? Because I see the amount of poke, which means that if Grand Zero are more proactive to go for these uh, objective plays, the retake potential from Kanga is going to be so frustrating to try and deal with. So that is my big question as we load into this one, an elimination match of fate that neither team really wants to find themselves in. And a single best of three that could decide if split one comes to a close right here and right now. Now, I will say, from the side of Kanga's comp, I do think the Vi struggles a bit um, compositionally, right? This is a champion that wants to engage, wants to pull that trigger. But really, there's nothing that wants to go in with her. You know, maybe the Gragas yeah. a little bit. But like we said, and we were talking about before, Jace and Varus very happy to play a range. Soraka especially, not a champion that likes to be playing forward. So I think this Vi is going to find the majority of its value in this early game, in these early game skirmishes. and trying to protect these really volatile lanes like the Jace, like the Varus Soraka. Just end up with like a black cleaver and just pray that your Varus yeah. and Jace are one hitting the person that you go on because you're most likely dying yep. after you press R. 100% early game, going to be a big deal here. And to your question as well, Skimmy, on like ease of execution, for me it's always who has the easiest source of just chucking out engage that's non-committal, which is the Sejuani by far, right? And mm -hmm. you've got Annie that can do a ranged tibbers, Sejuani with a ranged ultimate. If they miss, doesn't really matter. If Vi presses ult and it's mistimed, dead. So it's in terms of that execution, when you're looking at fights and objectives and stuff like that, very easy to play out Ground Zero's composition, because if it hits, it just works. Well, to see them. Certainly uh, a bot lane to keep our eyes on. We heard the testaments from uh, the bot lane of Chiefs, just seeing how strong Dante and Bulldog were in their execution. And Hooper and Shinky have certainly had their rough moments, but they have looked stronger in weeks go by. Let's see how they, uh, they fare in this one. And if, uh, you know, that Zeri pick, continues to dazzle. On a scaling basis as well, I think this game is actually quite even, to be honest. I think that the Zeri Lulu is, in its own, almost worth Kanga's entire comp in terms of scaling, because that composition is insane. But at the same time, it is an on-hit Varus, right? This champion is definitely able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe somewhat with the Zeri in terms of that late-game DPS. And Jace, obviously, we saw yesterday with Kisei hitting 12 CS per minute and just the Shock Blast, right? Impossible for champions like Lulu and yeah. Annie to really walk into fights. They're already chunked half HP before they even start. We're definitely at this meta, it feels like, where like Varus Lethality has insane value, but at the same time, you go Shield Bow Bloodthirster, and if Annie doesn't one-hit you, you just live forever. Mm -hmm. Lethal Tempo procs, and you just fight indefinitely. Uh, so it feels like we've kind of hit this crossroads where that's just what it's becoming uh, as junglers are staring each other down. Both know the other one's there. You know, it was nice by Nafar, though, to leash it away to make sure that Gooby wouldn't have the invitation or even an opportunity to try and steal it away from him. Midlane is getting a little bit excited at the same time as the junglers are right there in the vicinity. 
Nothing really more should come off this though, but a helping hand to crash the wave. And this is what I, what I would point out with Ground Zero, right, is the heads up ability for them to say, okay, well look at this massive wave we have mid lane. Gooby recognizing that and going, okay, well let's invade, you know, we do have a strong 2v2. Sejuani insanely strong level 3 junglers. Here we go, a bit of skirmishing. Certainly is a bit of skirmishing. Gonna get the passive off, gonna do a lot of damage individually, so much so that Mayfine is gonna be completely zoned away from this one. You will get counter jungled. Yeah, again, like you just mentioned, Max, the wave being so strong in middle, you can see Gragas has had zero mana to his name, was using Biscuits just to get abilities onto minions so he didn't miss them under the turret. Uh, does mean that Sejuani can just walk in and bully Mayfan away. Uh, earlier in the week as well, Mayfan was hovering mid lane relentlessly, just trying to make sure that Fido survived and persevered, but was never really doing anything proactive, and it feels like we might be going towards that pathway once again. However, as we say that, wants to have a look at Tron, he does want to have a look and is going to have a bit of a crack at it for the mean. So I'm going to do chip damage, but it's uh, a gank that's never really going to flourish into much more than that, right? The Jace locked underneath the turret, very low in resources, forced to go back to base. Actually just pushed the wave enough that a teleport might want to be used because he's hurt enough of those minions that it's going to push against the Jace. So we'll have to instantly teleport back to that wave and gives Tron the luxury of choosing. One of those ganks you really wish your jungler hadn't have done yeah. if you are blue here. But once again, top lane, not expecting too much action from this unless Gooby visits when it's convenient for him, right? You know, perhaps the wave's in a bad spot when his crocs are up, but apart from that, really not expecting too many resources to be invested at this point, right? Jace versus Cassante. You're expecting a couple plates, and I think Blue has definitely demonstrated that he is able to go up CS left alone. As we see already, very low. And they just used TP to get back to lane skimming. That they certainly did, and uh, Blue's obviously got to be quite careful here that he doesn't get dragged in. By Tron on the if he continues to go for this harass, we're going to do as much as he can, utilizing that range advantage now to try and crash this wave in and get at least one plate, get a gold lead. Make sure that he will be that really frustrating to deal with poke champion come those initial fights. Both junglers also parking their way back towards top lane. Blue playing hyper aggressive. Gooby now going to spot Mayfunk. Yeah, Tron's going to get the collapse on first, and that's the Vi jumping on through. Vi might be the first casualty, living as long as they can, but first blood goes the way of Tron. Boo, blue falls to flash across the wall, hates to see that one. A passive, a stun, and an engage that's going to find themselves a double. And it just feels like what happened during the regular season all over again. It's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. And the big difference here, Skimmy, is look at the items, right? Mayfun literally had nothing in his inventory besides the original smite. Gooby, meanwhile, on a balmy cinder, you're never going to win that 2v2. And, you know, when we talked about it shouldn't really be a volatile top lane, now Jace has no flash. It's two kills over to the size of ground zero. This is a potential avenue for Ground Zero to blow open this game. And just a huge knock-on effect as well, right, through the top lane itself. It's not just Mayfun that dies, it's Blue that suffers, it's a Jace that's no longer ahead in the way that he would like to be. You saw what he could potentially do when he was in that isolated 1v1 situation. But again, good heads up here from Gooby, knows where to be. Ward spots Mayfun, they immediately select the correct target. Like you saw from Tron Fryer in the earlier gank, can buffer the Vi is not going to knock him back. But you wonder what Mayfun's really doing walking out of that tri brush, right? I mean, all he's doing there, the wave is pushing back towards blue. All he should be really be doing is just making sure Gooby doesn't gank right then and get the kill. But Mayfun instead getting a bit too trigger happy, trying to potentially force a gank, and it ends up going bad. Now, as we mentioned, wave pushing away from blue. Gooby does have the ultimate, no flash on Jace. Yeah, it's a really rough spot now for Blue. It's only a situation he's not to be too happy about. And uh, a case of triage to be felt elsewhere on the map as already in the bot lane. It's a 20 CS deficit going away uh, against Hooper as well. Mid lane is seemingly now where you're truly well invested in. Yeah, I mean, this mid lane, I feel like it's really tough for Annie to really do anything against the Gragas. That passive meaning basically all of her damage is nullified almost. The mana is really the only thing that Fido has to worry about here. But once again, it's going to be a question of, you know, your point of strength really was blue in this 1v1. He's not able to be ahead. In, he's not able. He's not ahead anymore. How are you going to bail him out here as we see a potential fight onto mid lane? Gooby, no flash either, Skimmy. He certainly doesn't have flash, so he could be caught out of trouble, but just chucks at the ultimate very freely. Not a care in the world. Tron rotating from top side as well. Unlocked from that one, and you know, you poke your head into the river, but that's all it's really going to be. I mean, they had enough priority to look for something there, but of course, at the same time, may find not level six, so very hard to lock down that Sejuani. If you can just throw the ult and get out for safety, does mean that the ultimate is gone, so helps out those lanes just a little bit by forcing that one. Uh, but a little bit of nice use there from Kanga in terms of priority in mid lane. And keep in mind that that play happens after they spot Mayfun. Bulldog walks mid, they see him crossing mid. 
so they know he's in the general area and still Gooby face check. Very close there to a potential gank being spotted out, but Gooby doesn't manage to evade vision just for the meantime. Going to start up this first hero of the game, right on spawner, eight minutes in. And Mayfan is close by, but showing no interest for it right now. Bulldog as well as Dante on a full reset back from base coming to this one. This is going to be a full five-man attempt. Yeah, there's really no no way Kang A can contest this at all. And this is another example of Ground Zero really showing some synergy across the board, right? Sinking it with that bot lane base timer so they're able to get there. You're not fighting a level six Zeri with a Lulu and the Sejuani there. And, you know, 10 CS lead in the jungle. I think Gooby has kind of been running rings around Mayfan in this early game, answering all the plays something that Herald right on spawn and this is a really good way if you want to give some more extra gold to your Zeri who's already you know almost three waves ahead. I'm getting excited now in the bot lane as well taking a cheeky 1v1 might actually entertain the idea of going for this one. Oh, Gonna die to the dead. turret! Dante oh dead. my god! <laughs> Dante what are you doing my guy? He believed his own hype for too much time and Hooper is being bailed out in the most bizarre fashion. Not even sure that that was lethal amount of damage that Hooper flashed from, but better safe than sorry. Had the ultimate there, perhaps was going to look at Bulldog as Mayfun and Shinky were nearby, but yeah, a bit of happy gaming from the AD carry of uh, Crown Zero there. A little bit too happy, you might say. He did just come off a 10-0 and zero Zeri game, so he's, he's probably feeling himself a little bit, but yeah, I don't know. Not willing to use the flash there to dodge that last turret shot. Didn't have the heal either, instead of opting for that ghost, so no real way to get out. And that's one of those things, you know, it's better to get out of the way right now as opposed to perhaps in a team fight, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. 25, 30 minutes in. So hopefully his teammates have called him out for it and he's he's switched on. Bulldog hits him with the AO chill curve. <laughs> <laughs> he got the transcript. To slow down. I mean, everyone knows that's what <laughs> I was going to say, man. <laughs> Doesn't really deter away from the game plan of Grand Zero though, does it? They found the first Herald, the first Dragon, and found themselves with a gold lead as well. Very happy with the game state overall, 10 minutes in. And look at the items again, once again in the jungle, right? Flash the super. Yeah. Ooh, stun doesn't connect. Actually holds his nerve, doesn't burn the cleanse. Meanwhile, a 1v1 top side blue down a kill, receives a wish, flashes across. Oh, the knockback wasn't enough. Tron maybe looking for lethal. And it's dangerous, right? I mean, Blue getting his flash burnt 1v1 versus Tron there. Something you don't want to be seeing here is potentially the skirmish hasn't ended, Skimmy. Oh, it just you got your work cut out for I you. mean, I really do. It's so relentless, Max. It really sucks at this point of the game. Surrounded 1v4. What does he do? Fido. Oh, the flash from any. It's dodged it out. It does not matter. Either way, though, they will find that kill. Mayfan goes down. Hooper responds, taking out the jungler. Dante. And a kill across the wall. That's looking good. Hooper getting excited. But Dante is dead again. Dante trying to make montages, as it feels like, at this point in the game, is not showing enough respect to Kanga, who are able to, in their own jungle, find themselves a couple of kills, and are still in pretty even stead in this game. We'll see the skirmish one more time, because it is Gooby jumping over the wall, finding Fido. Still very tanky, keep that in mind, right? The Gragas has the catalyst build. He's very hard to take down in one fell swoop. Emphas comes in, not even close to having the stun ready. He's going to flash W and that gets flashed out and misses. And then at this point, Shinky trying to run away. Dante says, hold up. Maybe I've got something here, but he was pretty far off. Who let him Having cook? something there. <laughs> uh, and does go down a second time. Yeah, and you know, earlier in the game, it was almost a 20 CS lead for Dante down that bot lane. But if we take stock now, we see the Immortal Shield Bow already coming out for Hooper, right? So that is definitely a massive turnaround from the side of Kanga's bot lane. Definitely able to neutralize that fight. It did feel like a bit of an overcommit for Ground Zero, right? Burning so much to get onto this Gragas, who, like you mentioned, Rusty, is incredibly tanky at this point in the game. And we've returned to quite an even game state. Only 1,000 separating the yeah. teams at the moment. I mean, Top even equalized in CS throughout most of this as well. The second junglers weren't involved. It felt like it went back to business as usual. There was a Soraka used up there during a 1v1, which did keep Blue alive, but overall he has been farming pretty well, but being pressured as we speak. He's going to be careful now. The stun this time will land the knockback afterwards. The CC layering, there is no chance to survive this time. And the 1v2 proves to be a little bit too much to bear. And this is what happens to Jace, right? If your opponent is able to shove waves in, right? As Jace, you need to be having control over the waves. If your opponent's able to do that and you're able to get dove, it becomes so hard to play, right? As we see Mayfun trying to trade on the opposite side of the map. 
But realistically, a Jace who's getting crashed on getting dove like this by Sejuani just becomes free pickings, right? He's got no flash. He's so incredibly squishy. Even with, you know, something like the Soraka ult being available, he really stands no chance. Yeah, and keep in mind, if you're getting kills onto that Cassante, it's very easy to still buy resistances, even though he may lose them by using the ult. You've now got a Varus that's going to be close range with his on-hit build. You've got a Jace that does build lethality items. It does some damage, but not if they're able to stack armor for free. And it's now a 2-0-1 Cassante that's going to be coming to those team fights when they eventually happen. Very difficult to kill him, and Gragas' job is not to kill an armor tank. And a Warmog's Rush coming out here from Gooby. We've seen so many variations of the, uh, you know, Sejuani build with the Radiant Virtue being dominant for such a long time. I've seen Sunfire mm -hmm. make a bit of a return as well. And that seems to be the next option, but right now it's all about being as, as tanky and I suppose sustainable. You, know, you just throw yourself at plays on cooldown. Well, this makes a lot of sense, right? When you're against the Jace and the Gragas, basically your job is to stand in front and get hit by everything, right? You are wanting to tank those skill shots so your backline isn't. And that makes a lot of sense, right? He is going to be able to navigate a lot of these fights, you know, going in, taking up a JCQ, and then popping right back out. So I like this adaptation for Gooby, not just going for, you know, what the most popular option is. It's very smart into a poke composition as well, to be certain. One of my favorite reasons that I think Warmogs is just a great choice is usually around Baron and objective plays, because you just tank it, it doesn't matter. Mm. And if it doesn't go well, just leave, right? You don't actually lose any HP from doing that, and you maybe force a teleport, and that's all you're after. Uh, I love little plays like that that can come from having the Warmogs. But first and foremost, it is surviving a Varus, surviving a Jace, surviving a Gragas, as they just litter you with spells. So we have Rift Herald spawning in 10 seconds, Dragon in 30. It really seems like any fight around topside right now is just incredibly hard for Kanga to take, right? Blue still having no access to Flash means that if he gets put out by literally any single spell, he is going to die, whether that be a Kassante, Q, Sejuani, Ultimate, anything that Annie has, right? Perhaps Kanga looking towards this Dragon to trade, you definitely do need to set up with a comp like this, right? You need the opponent to be running into you. If you are walking into an Annie in Fog of War, a Sejuani, it becomes so hard, but they've brought Tron down. This could be a big fight, Skimmy. It certainly could be. Mayfun has hit that Black Cleaver spike as well, and that could be the amplification they need to make sure that a Fed Hooper is able to deal a lot of damage sitting on that one item spike himself. The Herald will be immediately summoned in mid lane. And that'll grant uh, Grand Zero the option to go to play for their second Dragon. Kanga grouping as well here. It does seem like they're showing signs that they want to at least prepare to fight this. Emphas has Tibbers and Flash ready and charged up Tron. Always going to be looking for a fight, hunting for it. We are getting a 5v5 at the Drake Pit. And we certainly are dragging down to 50% right now. Is it going to be that Burger Flip or are we going for the fight before? Tron jumps in, Flash from Memphis finds his target. Hooper in trouble, cleans out, Flash as well. But he's getting 1v1 right now by Tron and Tron deletes him. Now 3-0-1, unstoppable. He might have lost resistances, but he hasn't lost his confidence. Eventually gets shut on down. That means the world to Blue's chase. And now for Kanga, it's about making sure you can disengage. Look how low they are. Oh, that is, they escape by the skin of their teeth. Their low health bars below 200 on all three members. Is <laughs> Blue picks up Empress on the backside. But I want to shout out Tron there. In terms of using his lead to find value in those team fights, absolutely perfect. They find the initial gauge onto Hooper. You think it's fine. He cleanses, he flashes, he's getting killed by the Soraka. But then Tron finds him, using that all out as potentially Fido. <laughs> the observers will go, oh, oh. <laughs> is there the body slam? There's no flash on the Gragas, and that's something that Dante does have. So if Fido's not careful, he could actually die. It does seem like Dante, however, is going to prioritize pushing this wave in and then recalling. Oh. <laughs> Dante has lost the plot. Oh, no. Dante has officially lost the plot. He's been baited out. <laughs> someone check what ping he's on. <laughs> that's that's someone not timing sums is what that is. That's He thinks Gragas flashes up there. But as we take a look again, right, Look at Hooper in this fight. We see the initial engage, Emphis flashing forwards, finding that damage, and that Tib is onto Hooper. Look at the peelback, though. That initial Q from Tron, finding two. They almost one-shot him. Actually flashes into the Sejuani ultimate, but look at Tron. They can't stop him getting onto that backline, and he survives for so long. Once Hooper is dead, who really kills this Cassante, right? Blue is definitely not fed enough. He does eventually take him down, but look at the health bars now. All it is, it's a job for cleanup for the rest of Ground Zero. That's exactly what you want, right? With a Zeri in your composition, a tank like that causing disruption, standing in front of that Zeri as she stacks up the ult passive and hits the closest target. Very nice team fight from Ground Zero. Emphis with a tragic death at the end and an even more tragic flash from 
Dante, but still, the fight went their way. That's what matters. They'll break the mid lane out of turret as a result, as well as getting that second Drake. Hello. Here it's goes. a big full slow double TP to come on in. Look at Mayfun finding his target. Flash alt onto Zeri. You've got no flash. You've got no chance. Out got a tendrils to kick away. Dante's live somehow. Ice getting his way to victory. His team corral around and say, don't worry, mate. Oh, we'll no. get it done. Look at Tron. That was so, so dirty as they get the full ace. But what are they doing? I mean, what objective are they fighting over? They're just double TPing in. And this is what we talked about earlier, right? Vi wants to go in. Who is following her, right? Flash ulting the Zeri. Zeri is just in no man's land with the rest of her team. And then suddenly all it is is left for Ground Zero. These tanky members to run forward. No damage left to threaten them. And it's a clean ace. This game was close. That dragon fight on a knife's edge. But now... This game is blown wide open for Ground Zero. Yeah, they took a fight, but I don't think it was the time or the place to realistically be looking for that one straight after they've given so many items and advantages to the side of Ground Zero. They reset before they got that turret as well. It's not that they finished the Drake, went straight to this objective. The teleports come through, and again, talking about ideas and not timing, I like this. I like that they have reinforcements nearby, a Varus ultimate, right? To come through on top of this, Zeri. But Gragas literally says, go ahead, you can live, and knocks Dante to safety, and then the reinforcements are here from Ground Zero in the first place. Tron, an absolute menace, star of the show for oh, Ground Zero in this game, putting in so much work for them in team fights. It's filthy, and the thing is, you know, even if you kill Dante there, you're still getting aced, right? Yep. At the end of the day, the collapse from Tron just too good, and I think that once again, Kanga aren't really understanding that they need to, for the enemy team to run into them, right? They can't be going forwards like this because at the end of the day, Ragus didn't have flash there. Jace wasn't in position. You know, he landed the shock blast, but not able to get into that hammer form and jump on top of that Zeri, right? So, just too much of an overcommitment there. And now they're going to have to do a lot of work to dig themselves out of this hole. Feels like a lot of self inflicted pressure to perform, certainly when they knew that a flash had been burnt, perhaps from nerves on their receiving end, feeling like, hey, we can maybe take it to them right now. But it's a very scary topside for Ground Zero with an 8-2 scoreline combined. They can really skirmish with the best of times against whoever they want. And they really are just sieging up an absolute storm. They've Four turrets to none. Give me they're grouping up as five to defend a dead turret just because it's on the barren side of the map. They're just going to watch the turret fall, hold their hands and see it go down together. Ground Zero don't necessarily need to start this barren off by any means. Now they've seen five people drawn here. What that means is that no wave is being utilized and farmed. Hooper has to cleanse the sedge ult here as well. It is a bit of a jumble overall, and no real clear direction, no intent from Kanga, other than just trying to defend what Ground Zero were doing. That's their only game plan right now. So what are we thinking, Max? We look at the situation that Kanga find, uh, find themselves in now. They're down 7k gold. It really did just balloon wide open, right? But is there a world in which you say you still have the tools to try and claw back from an objective standpoint? From a straight 5v5 standpoint, it's looking far blown. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If straight 5v5, you'd have to imagine Grand Zero just sweep the floor. I think you really need to make use of this Jace in terms of getting some gold, perhaps putting him in a side lane. But even then, right, Ground Zero, they have Gooby, they have the Warmogs on him, they have the Cassante. They're able to tank this Baron to the second someone like Blue shows in that side lane, they are going to just start up that Baron. So it's really, really tricky here from Kanga now. They are going to have to just pray they're able to hit their item spikes and Hooper can eventually pull an amazing team fight out of the bag and, and carry, but certainly an uphill battle here. It'll have to be close to perfection in terms of how Hooper would navigate a team fight to get through both Annie, Kasante, Sejuani or running you down. Speak of the devils, they will have a look at Blue. Jace well and truly kept on the back foot in this one. And so much pressure mounts. I don't think there's any chance you can test the Drake in the first place. I think Kanga should be able to utilize this time to get some kind of vision uh, towards the Baron. Doesn't necessarily mean that that vision won't be cleared, but try and get gold where they can, try and set up where they can. You know, one cheeky ward in a place they can teleport to might be the difference between winning or losing fights. But even this, right, they're trading on the top side, but immediately it's going to be the Dragon and the Tier 2 turret in response, so, you know, trading even gold, fine when you're behind. You know, those early item spikes are going to be more impactful, but they're even losing when they're trying to trade, right? Only Tron on the top side of the map, and they're not ever able to break that second tier turret, so... Really hard, you know, getting in around this Baron, and I think you made the good point, Zach, 
being able to get vision is super important, right? You can't have someone like Tron flanking, because the second that happens, the second Varus is going to have to respond to multiple angles, mm -hmm. it's impossible to play. I would love to be able to just, like, pause and actually take a screenshot of where these wards are and how I could improve them as well, because the one directly next to Mayfun should just be further up near the wall. Mm. That was single control in the pit will clear that, where you can actually be cheeky and place them in different spots. That's something that if you were watching the LCO yesterday, you saw the Chiefs place vision in unique places that doesn't get cleared by control wards. Sweepers will spot all of this, yes, but sweepers aren't always available. Uh, but even now, right, Ground Zero have just walked into the pit, and if you look at the area where they have wards, they've got one that's already being control warded. That's it. That's all they've got left, and that was during the Drake being done. So they never really gained anything from this other than maybe 30 seconds of time for Ground Zero just to clear them. I mean, and this is something Grand Zero could do on repeat, right? There's no one from Kanga tanky enough to walk in that doesn't get one shot with the Sejuani ultimate. So TPs are being invested here. They know they're on the Baron. How are they going to answer? Yeah, Blue's TP's been held for the meantime. Now finally coming out, but GZ are rushing us one down. 50% already. 5v5. Look at, Five. Look at Emphis on the flank. Has a flash. Looking for a blue, and he finds it. Stun oh. one shot. I mean, good night. It's a little bit too easy for them. Hooper now the next one to focus on Dan. And he's in so much trouble. Dante flashing on his head. A wish. A dream and a potential outplay. Look how much healing there is. But in the flash forward again from Emphis. And he's just getting it done. He's removed two carries. His job is complete. And Grand Zero just a little bit too clean. The fact that the fight starts and the first two people that die are the carries in Blue and Hooper just shows how set up Ground Zero were for this skirmish. Now, easy it was for them to find these angles. The support squad of Kanga separated, coming through mid lane, completely different from the rest of their team. And Ground Zero, just a clean team fight using the leads they have. What are they doing here? They're going to try to go for a steal. It's only Fido and Shinky here. Excuse me, this is a Hail Mary if I've ever seen one. I mean, it's the biggest Hail Mary you'll ever see. There's no ultimate now for Fido. So really, what are we looking at? A, a random barrel cast to try and outplay a 1200 smite. It seems so, so doomed. And yeah, five members strong all uh, can go back to base with the Baron. But take a look at this fight once again. Emphis, the positioning there, absolutely perfect. Blue thinks he's safe, wants to walk up throw out those shock blasts, but just gets caught out. He doesn't even see Emphis before he drops the Tibbers. And there's Sejuani ultimate landing right onto Hooper. He manages to kite back, but the gold gap is just way too large at this stage. Dante, you know, perhaps feeling a bit too frisky for not the first time this game. But as soon as Hooper goes down and blue as well, there is just no damage left. And heading straight towards this Baron, all that's left is to really cross the T's and dot the I's for Ground Zero in Game 1. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the actual execution as well of how they get to that Baron pit, it feels like they started going the direction Blue was, then they all went through mid instead, through control wards, so Vision was given. They never really executed it together. I'd rather the five of them make a mistake and get Annie altered together instead of just being separated and letting your carries die. Uh, a lot of execution conversations, I think, to be had by Kanga when they void review this one. But I think right now, uh, Max, it probably is thinking about Game 2. Yeah, you, you, you sort of do what you can here, but realistically, anytime Hooper walks up having no flash now, it's just very scary. Obviously, he does still have that cleanse, but if he's even remotely in range, just the sheer damage from an Annie at this stage, coupled with the Zeri, you're probably going to get one shot, right? Same for the Soraka. So, really comes down to whether they can neutralize, and you know, even if they do neutralize this skimmy, there's a Dragon Soul spawning in a minute 20. Well, that's it, and also how do you defend these lanes with that of engage potential that Grand Zero oh. have? It is just relentless from top to mid, Mayfun. they continue to fight, and that is the Lightning Crash just to remove Mayfun. I mean, it's just a little bit too easy for them to get those pickings, they've got the gold lead, they've got the Baron buff, they've got the Siege to try and find themselves an inhibitor now. Vikewed in while his team was running, <laughs> he's just gone in. He's going to give away the inhibitor. Tibbers is going to one-hit any carry here as well. So just keep your eyes on Emphis at all times. Multiple inhibitors to fall here for sure. If not the game, they definitely have Ooh. the waves pushing in both mid and top. One member up as well. And there's just no one tanky enough. But it does look like Grand Zero are going to give a bit of respect here. They're going to say, you know, it might be a 95% chance we can end. But with that Infernal Soul, there's absolutely no chance Kangen can do anything to come back. Yeah, straight back to base, very quick for them still with that Baron buff active, and they can reset, respawn. With new items purchased, even more wealth to be acquired, and yeah, the icing on the cake, right? A, a Zeri composition with an Infernal Soul, I mean, really it doesn't get much better than that. Look how afraid Kangar are right now, they're gonna go straight through mid, they don't know that Ground Zero have reset. You assume they have, but what if you, what if they have it, and there's an Annie in a bush, right? It's terrifying, so they're gonna push mid, clear out those supers, try and get to the pit. The game is won or lost at this pit. It's basically lost already, but they're going to have to fight. 
Lots of flashes down, really looking towards May Final Fighter to try and do something cute and clever to clutch out straws here for the fourth dragon to be acquired by Ground Zero. They need vision first of all, but it's been leashed out of the uh, dragon pit. Oh. oh my god, Emphis, once again, putting a real standout performance. Is going to get taken down eventually by Hooper, but he'll trade his life for it. The dragon's still there, double for Emphis. Still, Tib is getting it done right now, and look how large Tron is. He has been all game. He'll play cleanup crew and get the final one in this interaction. Emphis looks so impressive on this Annie pick. We were questioning whether it was going to be able to find purchase in that mid lane, and it certainly has. Now, two fights in a Roach game, there's one shot, says Dante. Waving goodbye to Fighter, waving goodbye to Kanga's hope in this game one, as they will look towards this Nexus. And what a decisive win to start the series off, right? We talked about nerves from Kanga. If they weren't feeling nervous before, you have to imagine they are now. An absolute powerhouse performance from Ground Zero. 28 uh, minutes and it's all done here. 19 kills to seven, 10 turrets to one. I mean, every objective really went their way from Hell to the Dragons to the Baron as well. They showed synergy, they showed uh, understanding, and they showed uh, an ability to not be deterred, I suppose, by a few uncharacteristic mistakes. We saw Dante look a little bit shaky in the early moments there, dying uncharacteristically in a 1v1 underneath the turret, burning a flash in the mid lane, maybe not uh, respecting timers or having that one down pat, but didn't really upset the mental. I mean, they looked very clean overall came to the team fight, you saw that there were multiple chefs in the kitchen and they were all cooking Mac. They certainly were. And what a bloody game that was, huh? Interesting. Dante maybe getting a bit too big for his boots at points, not showing the respect or maybe something else going on. But either way, it worked out. There were moments where I did see Kanga almost finding angles back into fights. You know, Hooper was popping off at certain points until he wasn't, like, mm -hmm. towards the end in that second or third last fight. There was there was a lot of fighting going on at points where, like, as you mentioned, objectives weren't even up. They were just fighting for the point of bloody fighting, trying to assert dominance, so to speak. And, yeah, Emphis, you know, just flashing in, dominated Dante and... Not dominated Dante, rather, Hooper, rather. It was just, yeah, crazy. Absolute crazy. And what it seems to me, right, is it almost seems like a flow and effect of errors from the side of Kanga, right? It feels like one person makes an individual mistake, then that causes someone else to try to compensate and they sort of keep digging themselves down this hole. That started from as early as that first blood play in the top lane, right, where Mayfun, being a bit out of position, Blue jumps in, tries to save him, burns a flash and still dies, right? And a lot of these fights end up the same way, right? Whether that be an overcommittal from Mayfun going just a bit too deep and then everyone tried to compensate and they weren't able to find anything, but... Emphis certainly a powerhouse in this game on that Annie. Just filthy in some of these fights, the one shots he was able to pull off, particularly this one here, Mac. Yeah, that did seem to be a recurring trend that I noticed as well. <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that May Fun? Yeah, it was just in odd positions or committing without anyone close enough or just over committing and not getting out when the safety barrier, uh, the theoretical safety barrier is still there to walk away. So, look, it went, didn't go well, didn't go well for Kanga in this game. GZ, I thought they were probably going to make it look a bit more dominant than what they did, so we'll see if they can clean it up into game two. But in terms of the stats here, are we happy with what we've got coming out of GZ, Skimmy? I mean, absolutely. I think for the for the early game, you'd definitely put a lot of credit towards Tron and Gooby in tandem. They really had that one down pat. I mean, their Kadia was phenomenal. It really drove home the point that 50 minutes in, very hard for you to recover. But then late game, as Max already mentioned, that all belonged to Emphis in the mid lane on the Annie. I mean, item-wise as well, it just was raw damage uh, and great flexibility. I think it was just really cool to see the Warmogs be rushed, given sort of the concerns that could have been raised from Kanga's retake. But they never really got that chance, right? Just the squeeze, the vision control, as Rusty also mentioned. Just very, very hard for Kanga to ever step up. And uh, if they ever did, they were isolated. They were picked up. Yeah, they certainly were. Now, look, Rusty, you were talking about that theoretical draft that you wanted to see Kanga pick to try to counter GZ. Did they hit it? Did they hit the mark? Or is it still no, something no, no, no. to work I'm going to keep that draft in the bank for now. It's, it's, I'll, I'll message Kanga after and we'll discuss it. But that's not really the, the big talking point for me in this one, Mac, okay. because it did feel like it was still, like, with the draft that they had, it still felt like it was a winnable game. Uh, I do think there was no real concerns with scaling. Once they had a 2 0 1 Varus there, they just needed to know how to deal with the Annie. But the bigger issue was how they were fighting for objectives because they were walking into an Annie composition, right? They're walking into a Sejuani composition and just instantly dying for it. So for me, it's about setup and how they're actually executing when they want to fight. Because right now, I think we're looking at a team that can only engage with Mayfun and he's constantly losing early games. So if that's the case, they got to try something different. Yeah, change it up. You know, you've got at least one more game to save your bloody lives here in the LCO. And you guys always save my life as well, of course, with from the fans. 
just with the content, with the pure content. You make my job bloody easy. That's what I'm trying to get at. And we've got some more submissions for your favorite legendary League of Legendary Dens skins. Uh, who do we have here? We have a real squid with Battle Bunny Sarah Fortune doing the bunny hop. Why Sarah Fortune? Wait, what? That's her real name. My name oh. is Sarah. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Max with the... With Usually we have uh, Law Girl Kitty who just knows everything. But look, look at those She gave me the hamster study before. Ah, cool. What's Polish up with all those pixels? Where are they? Yeah, bro took this on his phone and then sent it in. <laughs> He's playing TFT. It's good to help me out here. I yeah. haven't seen this skin. No, it's not a very popular one. Battle money? I, I would say, in my opinion, the GOAT Misfortune skin has to be Bewitching Prestige. Ooh, yes. yeah, yeah, prestige. Yes. That is good. I agree. So yeah. Hard agree. Yeah, Not a legendary I agree skin too, huh? The I Gun exactly Goddess one's one that pretty is. good, though. I'm a fan of the Gun Goddess one. Okay, I, that's the only one I own, I think. That's what's your lucky. favorite? Those bloody Twitch Prime capsules. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Oof, yeah, come through clutch. Uh, we've got a few more to have a quick look at as well. Thank you, Squido. What do we have as the next submission? Oh, yeah. We've got JB. Again, Debonair Z is a vibe. You reckon? That is a vibe. Yeah. I mean, look at him. Tell me that's not a vibe. Purple and green. Complimentary Goes colors. Huh? That whole skin line, I, I, I forget who else there was. I think there was a Master Yi skin with it. Mm -hmm. Debonair. Uh, Draven. Yeah. The, the recent Debonair e. drop was like Pike. a really cool skin line. Was there a Pike? Oh, maybe there was. There was a really cool Pike skin that came out around World's Time as well. Yeah. That one was nasty. The old animation like fogs up the screen if they get a an ace. You're really getting into oh, this yeah. skin discussion. It blows up the... Yeah, that's yeah. what happens to Dante. His graphics card... It explodes enemy <laughs> team's graphics card if you get a pentakill. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, uh, look, maybe <laughs> it's worked. Pixels. Maybe skins get the wins. That's what I've been told. Now, yep. look, let's have a look at the next submission as well. Who do we have here? Mordred. Mm. Yeah. Spirit Blossom Thresh. I need I say more. I've got... Is it Spirit Blossom? <laughs> He's talking to himself. Yeah, I actually, had to chime in on this one. Where's the social media <laughs> thing where like you're with the medal? Like you're just yeah, giving yeah. it to yourself? <laughs> hey. Let's Spirit boost those interactions. Is a kindred one as well, right? Yes. And yeah, yeah. All Mordred plays is No LeBlanc. I'm thinking of someone else. Wait, does he play Kindred? No, he plays Kindred. No, he Kindred, plays uh, Kindred is played by Voldemort. We cannot speak about Yes, them. we cannot speak about Voldemort. What? It's if you know you know. Like what I don't know either. Either. Like what Carbon posted yesterday. You remember that conversation? <sighs> Did you see that? No, I have no idea what we're okay. talking about. But right, fortunately, in the past. you guys in the have past. to fill me in while we go to a break. Let's just get a second game to get to. <laughs> I like ghost I'm cleanse. gonna stop doing my throws if you keep talking over me, Skimmy. Huh? We're gonna jump hey. to the break, and after this, we have game number two. <laughs> They'll break the mid lane out of turret as a result, as well as getting that second Drake. Hello. Here it's goes. a big full slow double TP to come on in. Look at Mayfine finding his target. Flash ult onto Zeri. You've got no flash. You've got no chance. Out for the tendrils to kick away. Dante's lived somehow. Ice getting his way to victory. It's his team corral around and say, don't worry, mate. Oh, we'll no. get it done. Look at Tron. That was so, so dirty as they get the full ace. But what are they doing? I mean, what objective?
back to the LCO. We're halfway through a series, maybe one third of the way through a series. Who knows? It's all up in the air right here on the couch, including Max's alias. He just said he wanted to change it to Bumper. So if we could get yeah. that sorted, graphics guy out the back, Marshall, my man. Thanks, Matt. Uh, look, either way, look, we got to talk about, yeah, to Bumper. He just said, damn, Bumper would be a cool nickname. I said, I'd love I said to have name. That. Like, I'd be called Actual Bumper name. instead of Max. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. It would on. be kind of cool, actually. I'm just trying to figure out a way, a connection between Max and Bumper. <laughs> it's there we go. Been Thank, Thank you. Actually, Thank you. Thank you. Was quick. Look at that. I, love, I love your production. On uh -huh. point. Perfection. Beautiful. Perfection wasn't what we saw from either of those teams, though. So what can they change to make it a little bit cleaner in game two? What are we expecting Kanga to do in terms of that side select? Should they jump onto the red side and go for that counter pick? I think so. Yeah. I think they should. I think... I mean... We say that, but then the reason I would want them to go on towards the red side is so they can secure a winning bot lane matchup. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I think top lane is just going to be the exact same every single draft. It'll just be Tron picks a carry. Sorry, Tron picks a tank, blue picks a carry. They're happy to handshake that. Um, but I think you need to win bot lane. And Soraka Varus, definitely yeah. something you can't force the win on, right? It's it's more of a, you know, you're going to win in team fights because you kite back and you're unkillable type thing. But I really need Hooper and Shinky to take over the lane and ma mark their... Make them mark on the bolo. I think not a lot just of... get it, it too much aggression from the tower and die. You know, well, but... yeah, tr ideally don't die to the tower at one v zero. I <laughs> for me as well. Like when you look at red side, people look at the fifth pick and they're like, "That's like obviously the most important thing." But the other point that is really valuable is third pick into bans. Yeah, and I think that's something that they should consider. Right, if you're not an Annie playing team and you're not going to ban the Annie, you don't need to be on blue side because they're going to prioritize that Annie. Right. And it becomes a really interesting game now if you've kind of revealed that you don't play it. But if you don't go blue side, they now don't need to pick the Annie because you've shown you can't play it. Yeah. And so it's losing even harder, potentially. So they may even be bottlenecked into just staying on blue after this loss because they just need to prioritize like the Varus or the, you know, the Vi, uh, knowing that they can't play it anymore. I think personally, they just need another source of engage, a bit of backup because Mayfarm looked completely isolated. The one thing that was always going to stick out for me is when he went for the double TP in mid lane, they hard flash all onto Dante and he just gets out scot free. Yes, you got the damage, but like who else is helping? Where's the Nautilus, the Fresh, like something along those lines. Was this the thickness that Fido was alluding to, was picking up the Gragas, <laughs> putting that into the, into the champ pool? It has to be a big part of it. Yeah, he played yeah. it earlier uh, in the week. So I think that and what was the other champion that he played? I have it. He played Tristana. Yeah, Gragas. Played yeah, yeah. So adding Gragas in, I mean, adds a layer. Hopefully he plays the Annie. I okay. mean, it's mm. not hard to play Annie. Well, let's see what Kanga have decided to do for the draft. They go mm. on red side. So do you think, as you were speculating, Rusty, Kanga might just lose even harder in the draft? I'm going to say yes. Yeah? I think what will happen, <laughs> with right? The, with the shit-eating green. Uh, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do you want from me? Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> try, I'm trying to throw him a bone, but I can't come up with an answer on the spot mm. for this one. It seems like a really difficult spot to be in. Yeah. Banny Annie, remove the Siren ban, feels like a bit of a waste, plays into Blue's champion pool anyway, so yep, um, why do that? Um, I think you just need to make sure that if, if it's not going to be Jace for Blue, give him that split push or, or give him that, uh, that engage like a Camille. On 13.2, AP junglers were like the go-to, right? And AD was kind of what you wanted to shift towards at mid. And Fido had a lot of AD champs towards mid. Mm -hmm. Do we expect that to maybe slide back in or is Mayfan just going to try to pick Vi and force it again? I think it's just going to be the exact same jungle champions by yeah. Sejuani trade on repeat. One thing I do want to point out in the draft though is yesterday's match, Ground Zero didn't actually first pick Annie when they had blue side and it was on ban. They yep. did let that go towards Chiefs. Mm -hmm. So potentially, Rusty, like you mentioned, we could be seeing a game of Annie Chicken where, you know, neither team really wants to pick it. They want the other team to pick it. And yep. it ends up, ends up potentially falling down towards some of those later picks. But I think that Skimmy made a really good point in terms of leaving that Scion ban. That seemed kind of questionable to me, right? Cassante mm -hmm. and Scion. Scion's maybe just a tiny bit better version of Cassante, but I don't really think it's something you're worried about breaking the game. Okay, if it is going to well, be any chicken, I'll just quick no, point No, you there, shut mate. up. You stole okay. my bloody throw before. I'm stealing your point to talk about the deaf fan vote. Get those Twitch points in. We want to know Let's what you out. think, not what he thought. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start talking over you. I'm going to come in mid-cast. I'm going to start play-by-playing playing while you're play-by-playing. Playing, All right? This ain't Valorant. What's that have to do with oh, anything? Oh, no, Spike has been diffused. <laughs> <laughs> and if you hear that, mid-game... Mid Skippy's going it to world. It was me, apparently. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a game changer, mate. <laughs> yep. Yep. Of course, yeah. Well, yep. get over there. You are a disruptor. No, oh, I certainly could be. It really is. What's the map? Icebox? Yep. Load her up, mate. <laughs>
<laughs> he doesn't know what he's saying. Let's bro. draft. Let's draft. <laughs> Kimmy's yeah, got a pick. solid two hours in that game, and he's just saying like the three words that he knows because right, he heard uh, them earlier. Let's yeah. plant uh, yeah. triple smokes in this quadrant of the map. And, That's uh, what I said. To let's come push your stupid B, B spawn. <laughs> yeah, mate. Jiggle peeking, holding the angle, mate. Yeah, mate. I don't know how we got here. This t you love tangents. Yeah, he's so my point anyway. So anyway, so like, what I was trying to say before you rudely interrupted me. Did we me, say death So if you, if you do play any chicken, yeah, what that, happens okay. if Zeri just gets locked in by Hooper, uh, rather Dante again? Like, surely Hooper says, I've got something prepared. Like, maybe it is the Draven, but then you need strength elsewhere. That's what I wanted to say, Mac. Thank yeah. you for having my space. No worries. This was my TED talk. You're welcome. Do you need more space? I feel like you could nudge that knee a little bit How's further. How's Aphelios into Zeri? Pretty grim. I think Aphelios is pretty bad in general right now. I really don't like it really? too much. Is Kate still good? Yeah, yeah Kate's yes. being perma banned. Okay, Kate's good. Well, let's see if that happens again. No camera this time. No cheese comp. Maybe a W for either of these teams and an L for the other one. That's going to happen 100% because Champ Select's bloody ready. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye now. Oh. Oh, grounds are actually opening up with the Varus, because yes, the Zarya was banned. So to the point of what happens with Annie, I guess this really is the answer now. Do Kanga lock it in their next rotation? Eh? <laughs> yeah, I, I was, was going to yeah, say. I know, I know. Ain't no way. Ooh. But Ooh. this, now this, we talked about Kanga. We want them to have a winning bot lane. We want, to have them, well, we want them to have something that can really win the lane. And picking Samira says, we are going all in on this bot lane. Here's the thing, right? You pick Samira, you pick a jungler. You don't pick Nautilus here because yep. you know the Bulldog plays the Heimerdinger. Mm -hmm. Bulldog locks in Heimerdinger, what do you do? Cry. You cry. Jive and flex. It was uh, what we would have had in that game mm -hmm. three last night. Samira, the reason that I bring this up is very reliant on having an engaged type of support. Yep. Jarvan's one of those weird ones as well if we want to talk about it being flexible, where he can engage, but often in the laning phase, he's like an airy Emax. Jarvan that's just for poke and harass, not so much for the all-in, uh, because he can be considered quite fragile. Uh, so it is a very difficult place to be in if Bulldog does exactly what we saw from him yesterday, which is preempt something like a Nautilus uh, with things like the Heimerdinger, but not going to happen. So the RE take it away, and Emphis finds himself another champion with a lot of ability to influence the outcome with those huge picks, much like he did on the Annie game number one. What a Kanga lock in here as a response, and it's going to be a hover of Ooh. the Cassiopeia, having seen that his champion pool really is being attacked. He's gone back to the uh, hyperscaling AP mages. Yeah, and again, Kanga already showing a bit of disjoint in terms of their team composition, yeah. right? You do have the Samira and Jarvan, who are going to be sprinting in every single fight. You can guarantee that they're going to be diving. And Cassio is a champion who really struggles with that, right? We obviously know Fido. This is one of his comfort picks. This is probably the pick that he's most known for in terms of being able to pop off and have those carry performances. But once again, you know, finding a bit of uh, hesitancy in terms of that whole team comp syncing up. The thing that I'm kind of looking at, right, is I would rather be the Varus with my support getting banned than the Samira with my supports getting banned. Yeah. Because if they get rid of sell it, like say Nautilus, Leona, you don't have many options left. You're looking to force a Rel or something into mm. a composition and. Because they've shown the Jarvan, uh, Ground Zero immediately respond with an Ari and a, and a Vi that can get out of that ultimate as well. They can't just be locked down. And so things like the Rel can also be dashed away from. It becomes a little bit more difficult to navigate those team fights. Uh, so I think that, yeah, like they're not going to go for the Leona. There is still going to be some options there for Kanga, but it's just a dangerous draft is really what we're getting at here. A lot of gauntlets and risks being taken. And I think Kanga are sort of gambling on that Jarvan potentially acting as a flex pick in the eyes of Ground Zero, right? Not wanting to fully commit to banning supports or junglers, period, just because you don't know where it's going. But Rakan is, you know, traditionally one of the less heavy, always, always fighting picks, more versatile, more able to play what you need to, and denying that from Bulldog as well, potentially a big swing in terms of things. I mean, if I'm Bulldog, I slam a Leona or an Alistar here 100% oh, yeah. anyway, right? You've just seen the Rakan, it's not going to be a comp pick. They've just gone for what I guess Chinky feels like is the best choice for himself. Uh, you've also got the option if you really wanted to have a Thresh. Now that you've seen Rakan and you know that there's a mm -hmm. Lantern for Javanaut for your Varus, I think was certainly a possibility there, but he's gone for the Moo Cow. Bit of aggression down in this bottom lane from Bulldog. Well, Alistar is so annoying for Samira to play into as well. Like, it is one of those champions you absolutely hate seeing locked in because the second you jump in, you're going to get headbutted away, you're going to get pulverized, you're going to get CC'd. 
That on top of a Vi, who's going to be sitting on top of the Alistar with all that CC, makes it really hard. And Tron's signature pick, we saw him have an absolute field day with his Olaf, and here it is again. Yeah, I mean, you can lock him down with the Jarvan, but the Cataclysm um, is only going to hold for so long, right? The Petrifying Gaze, the Charm of the Rakan, it's all nullified. It's all gone, right? So you've got all this displacement for the Samira 1v9 show, looking to try and pull the trigger but then it's all going to come unstuck by the fact that you've let this Olaf go through before and you were burnt by it um, during the regular season. And this is the problem with picking Samira so early in a draft, right, is that the enemy team knows full well what you're going to try to do and he's going to build a comp to counter it. Olaf is perfectly fine with the Samira dashing onto his head. He loves that, makes his job easier, right? I do like the Jax, though, coming out from blue here. Into Olaf, it is a bit of a skill matchup, particularly once level 6 comes through. Tron can definitely have his way with the lane, being able to pop that Ragnarok and nullify Jax's E. But as we look at scaling and as this game goes later and later, this Jax and this Cassio are certainly going to be able to take over the game if, that's a big if, the game state is somewhat even. And that's what you're really hoping for, right? You are hoping for an even game state because Kango completely changed up their identity from game one into two, right? More engage, more options to play towards those side lanes, uh, more scaling. And also just, I, I suppose, a, a more committal idea, apart from really the Cassiopeia, you would say, of we are going forward and, um, you know, may find you won't be, you know, left of the wolves as such. This is definitely one of those drafts, though. And like you just mentioned before, Max, with the difficulty of playing Samira, it's also going to be difficult to play the Jax with things like the Alistar simply being there, right? So being on the blue side, Ground Zero kind of get given their opponent's composition, just they get the notes in advance, mm -hmm. right? They're able to draft a composition that they're super happy with. And that's the thing. Not only is their comp really good, just in general, they have a strong front-to-back type composition. They've got good flank potential opportunities there from Olaf or Vi. They also just seem like they're really good into Kanga's composition as well. Well, here we have it then. Loading into the rift for our second game. Ground Zero already on a match point, and Kanga staring down the potential 2 0 scoreline with their season coming to a close very early on. It hasn't really been the strongest start for them. They've got the potential, but never really been able to hit the highest highs. Really came to a conclusion at the, uh, or conclusion rather, at the very end of that round, Robin, having taken down the Chiefs. But let's see with a different take on things this time. Is this enough to bring us into a game number three? Yeah, and one thing I do want to point out, we have gone for the exhaust on the Alistar here, allowing Varus and Dante to pick up the Ghost. Now, this is something, Ghost, in terms of summoner spells that feel good to play with as you get later on into the game, I think it's really unparalleled as an AD carry. Mm -hmm. Really, especially when you're against a short-range composition like this, if you are able to work your way around that primitive of the fight, you know, it's going to be very hard for Cassio to get on top of you because she's actually gone for the barrier. And that's not, not something you see very frequently. You almost wonder whether a cleanse here would have been good against an Ari, against a Varus. You get caught up by either of either the Charm or the chain of, Chains of Corruption and you're as good as dead. But we will see as this game goes on. Fido has probably a thousand games of Cassio in his career. So. Oh. Without a doubt. And I mean, speaking of those summoners also, I mean, the fact that top lane has the uh, TP Ignite, right? No flash, no ghost to match. So this is Blue saying, I'm all in on this idea. What is that ward going to do? Mayfun just walks towards the bot side of mid, places a ward in a position that honestly won't even reveal anything unless Gooby's going to path directly from red to blue through that bush. <laughs> it's a little bit baffling. I uh, didn't recall for the sweeper, so it feels like a last-minute decision here by Mayfun. Uh, it could indicate that he wants to go vertical jungle. Uh, it does seem like that might be what he's after. Always going for the level two. I was going to say, this ward is, seems to me like something from Scrims, right? You know, where the Vi does red, goes and queues into that bush, waits for a queue to come off cooldown, and then tries to burn a sum. But here we go, Skimmy. We certainly are looking for that potential first blood. Not to be the case, though. Just two flashes burnt. And a uh, hmm. disengage away, but... That's your classic Jarvan gank, isn't it? Level yeah. two, we're on. Set up by Fido as well. Uh, the other part that we didn't get to mention prior to that is he swept the what? top side bush. He didn't sweep the bot side bush, so he is being seen. Uh, but that was how they set up for that gank in the first place. It does end up just being a flash for flash trade. Junglers 99 times out of 100 will take that anyway because it means Ari has no flash. And you come back. You 100% are coming back. But a nice somewhat premeditated play here from the side of Kanga. Now, I was wondering whether they were going to look towards this bot dive, right? You know, maybe that level 2 mid translates into your fighter able to come down and dive that bot lane turret, but not going to be the case. Instead, Mayfun going to continue his jungle clear. And like you said, Skimmy, this top lane is so volatile, right? That ignite making sure Blue really is able to find 
any solo kill that he can, but seeming like he's a bit scared to walk up. We saw Gooby, what Gooby did to him last game. He really doesn't want to repeat it at this one. And talk to me a little bit about this match, having, having been a top laner yourself. I mean, how does it really play out? Is it, is it a, a clear favorite or very much 50-50? So it's, a, it's an interesting matchup in that you definitely have your windows where each champion is favored. Early levels before six, Jax is favored just because his E finds so much value. It's just a melee matchup versus Jax. Not many champions are able to compete with him. Um, but as soon as level 6 comes in, there is certainly a window before Jack scales where Olaf can kill him, right? Popping that Ragnarok, just face tanking and running him down. That's why Blue has gone for the Ignite, but potential 3v3 here. Mayfun's not spotted in this bush if Kanga do decide to look for anything. It does make you wonder who actually wins those 3v3s, however, as they are still looking. Nice headbutt pole combo. Yeah, really clever, wasn't it? As the passive goes out as well, Gooby jumps in with the... Uh Chance to try and find that first blood once again. It was Mayfun on the disengage way more interested in picking up that Scuttler Crab, but his team, at least his bot duo, very low. Look at that mullet adds IQ to Bulldog. <laughs> the way that he played that one out. He headbutted into the wall, proc Glacial, and dodged out on the grand entrance from Rakan at the same time. So stocks going through the roof from the party haircut, perhaps. But here we go. Grand Zero have read this play then. No Mayfun. Surprise. Ganking. No flash, Gimme. Yeah, he's in a lot of trouble. If uh, Grand Zero were to overcommit to this one, and that will be Gooby starting things off once again. Bulldog just a little bit too far away to try and land a W combo. That was a blast cone to disengage away as well. But it is Grand Zero certainly looking to be a little bit more proactive in these early moments. Even Gooby sticking around. Yeah, certainly not wanting to let any play go unpunished, but a good read here. And there there's some low health bars here, but you have to imagine Gooby no flash. Hard for him to get across this wall and, and really remember, force a dive. No ignite if they are going to go for the dive here, so they are miss missing a fair bit of lethal damage. Ignite is going to be there from the side of Kanga if it comes to it. So perhaps they just veer to the side of caution. We're not the LPL, we're not going to do everything as a dive. I think it was just going to take too long to also crash that wave in with a, a fresh one approaching. Would have been a lot lost time there for Gooby. As Mayfan is uh, once again squaring up in the mid lane, knowing that Emphasis Flash is down. Charm starts it off, so maybe now feeling a little bit more inspired for it. That's Fido flashing forward with Myers on the ground, trying to root him in place, trying to get the damage. And the Twing Fangs, they get it done, and that's first blood for Kanga. Mayfan is stepping up when Kanga need him to the most. Being incredibly inactive in that game one, but here already, so making those early plays. Sag. Observers and mid laners, what could you say? <laughs> <laughs> we, you know they're zooming in on those cannons, but like you just highlighted, Max, it was proactive. And we spoke about this between games as well, right? Like I have this feeling of Mayfun perhaps being the most important part of the team, the one win they have. It was Fido drop shipping him everywhere with the Rise ults, yeah. but it was still a very fed Amumu that was running around. So if he's able to get these ganks off and set those lanes up, perhaps that gives confidence for finding engage angles for the whole team. Because uh, that is where they are sorely lacking, is finding and recognizing, recognizing those angles. And Fido and Cassiopeia are certainly not a champion you want to be seeing getting fed early on in the game. Particularly looking at the comps, right? You have an Olaf, you have a Vi. These champions later in the game against the fed Cassio are basically just like butter to a hot Bulldog. knife, right? They're going to melt. But look at that position from Bulldog. Fido, no flash. And he's just gone for the head by into a Chan. The waiting arms, if you will, as Mayfun jumps in. The Medusa gaze goes across, but not too much avail. In comes Super now. He's found one. And they found two as the collective have Kanga. <laughs> this Blue. is what you need. Where you going, Blue? Blue curious as to where do I turn my attention to? A headbutt, a pole. And nowhere really to run as the cowbell goes off. But the kills continue to go the way of Kanga. Uses the ignite there at the very last second to make sure that he gets the kill. And suddenly Kanga, look at the scoreline right now. It is four to zero. Hooper comes into the mix, gets some kills. And they headbutt Fido in to start the play off. And it goes in the favor of Kanga. You can't ask for a better start to this one. And just quickly shout out to the barrier from Fido as well to make sure that he stays happy and healthy in this one. Yeah, but take a look at this again, right? Gooby has to stay around and finish off that dragon, so he's not able to immediately get onto Fido. They're not able to take him down. In that interim period, Hooper's able to get up here and make the difference. Meanwhile, Blue's roamed down all the way from top lane, and they're able to find a really clean fight. And once again, off the back of Fido, this is the man we needed to step up. We needed to see him take control, and he's doing that so far. Almost feels like a bit of a captain's performance, right? A case of saying, this is my signature champion. You're banning me, you're targeting me in these drafts, but I will not go out. Not in this fashion. You know, I've played this game for far too long. Mm -hmm. It's a full victim to a, you know, an 0-2 week of uh, 
of destruction on stream as there is the Cataclysm. Olaf will be punished, but hits the Ragnarok and looks to try and do as much as he can, fighting inside. <laughs> he sees the immune and actually just living. Ultimately, it takes three members to take him down. Look, it wasn't perfect, but they get the kills. That's what matters. They have the damage. Now looking at the Rift Herald, basically on spawn. You've got Dante who's moved up, Bulldog who's here, Emphis no ult, but does have that flash back. They can't do this. They're just way too low and they've got four full health bars here from Ground Zero, Skimmy. It's almost like they've just leashed it for them. Yeah, and Hooper's not even interested, right? He's bot lane pushing in a wave. He's pushing in for turret plates. Found one so far, just buying time, drawing the attention of Ground Zero elsewhere. Not going to die for the process of that leash, but certainly looking to try and invest more resources in where they are strong. You're right, when it comes to the numbers game, they really were just leashing for them. The fact that Hooper had no intent to move, which is not that that's an incorrect decision by any means. No. The rest of his team were committed to the objective, and they could have just been able to take that kill, turn that into waves, pushed, right? If Granzo were going to put that much effort to moving for the Herald, that's three waves, that's more money. They could have been happy with that, but unfortunately, they also put time towards it. Yes, here we go. Blue, no ultimate on Tron here. And here we go. We already see if the Ignite's available there for Blue, potentially that could result in a solo kill. We've already seen Blue on his jacks, on this aggressive pick, able to find advantages in the lane. But here we go, he doesn't know Emphasis roaming up. And he's got to be careful now. One cheeky attack onto Tron. Gets a turret attack as well at the same time. Counter-Strike expires and maybe his life will as well. Can he take one to the grave with him? He's leaping away, he has no flash. He's going to die to the turret. Really smart. Yeah, that was good. Emphasis doesn't even get an assist, doesn't get involved in the kill whatsoever. Really doesn't want to have to waste the Spirit Rush to yeah. try and get involved in that one. So nicely done with Blue in a bad situation, no way out. Finds the best possible outcome that he can. As Mayfun now hovering bot lane as they push towards that tribush as well. Just really trying to pressure any way they possibly can as a response to this one. But ultimately Tron is going to get some plates. He's going to be pretty happy with the how this has panned out in top lane. Feels like plates are being traded pretty aggressively all over the show, right? We saw mm. a bot just before in mid lane by the fact that Fighter was left alone too. He's managed to find a couple. And already, look at that gold. The Rod of Age is just now completed for Fido. He's up quite a large amount of CS and gold as well. This Cassiopeia is an absolute menace. And in terms of the gold going on to Vi, you're completely fine with that as Kanga, really. I mean, that one item spike, sure. It's nice for Vi to have, but realistically doesn't scale too much after that. It's really these carries you need to be getting gold onto. Someone like Dante is going to be really your main source of damage in this late game. And Hooper, we talked about before, able to get some plates, able to crash some waves on the bot side while Grand Zero were rotating for that Herald. So, pretty good spot. You'd have to feel, if you're Kanga, definitely better than the majority of their early games. Gooby knows exactly where Blue is here as well. Just watched him clear a ward out. He's going to have to wait for that Q cooldown, but it is up right now. And Tron, it feels like a bait, but also you're not sure if it is one, because uh, Gooby wasn't really intending, but here we go. Gooby does have the ultimate, charging it up so far. Is he's going to try and take the fight to Tron in a 1v1, but it was never going to be that. Going to lose a massive wave down for 20 seconds, and yes, you can TP, but your turret might be gone before that. Completely gone. I mean, it was a little bit dicey for a second there. I wasn't sure Gooby was on the same page as Tron, but hey, the Olaf's got the shield now. Since those changes, we'll be able to persevere. Uh, the turret is definitely going to fall as well as reinforcements from Ground Zero to secure that one. They're going to be trading for the objective of the Drake. Yeah, and really nice from Ground Zero, actually. Do they dive? They have the ultimate on Alistar. They can tank this up. Blue, not like this. 1v3, he's just come back. Oh, once again, locked in place, leaping away to a rogue minion, gets smited on, and really trying to do Tron? as much as he can. Tron going to be denied. At least one kill was found. The blue is being camped and they might just get two turrets. <laughs> yeah, looking like they will get two turrets for this one. Dante also going to play goalkeeper for the top lane. Uh, we'll find a Jarvan in very <laughs> short order. We'll see how long they stay for this one because it doesn't feel like there's going to be a collapse. Emphasis in bottom. Yeah, can they get a retaliation kill in the bot lane as a response? That is the question right now. The Inferno trigger is pulled. Shinky survives and the turret aggro is really juggled pretty well. Yeah, well played. But I do want to shout out Ground Zero for that really heads up play. I mean, in how many situations does your Alistar and Barris run mid off that spawn, right? They already foresaw that play, they saw the dive top lane, and they knew that they were going to be able to pressure it on towards that second turret. So Bulldog, I mean, he's looked great on these aggressive picks, and once again showing why he is such a menace on these. 
while all this is happening, meanwhile, Hooper getting more and more fed to Samira, finding kill after kill. But I will say, look at the gold mm. lead. It uh -oh. was so far ahead for Kanga just a moment prior. I want to say up by 3 or 4k. It has completely come to an even game set again, just most in part to great targeted ganks. Turret's obviously achieved as well. And the Herald finding success as we do jump into a pause. And we have to hope that this is nothing too severe. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these fights have been happening away from Fido, which if you're ground zero is absolutely where you want them to happen. If you're Kanga, not so much, right? I think these fights look very different if you have the cast here entering these fights. And it's really going to be on Kanga to position Fido around the map where he is able to fight, right? Because you get him into these champions that are diving forward, he is going to shred them. They're doing the thing that tilts you in solo queue as a top laner, especially with the second gank after a death, right? They stay yeah. top lane for an extra 30 seconds. They just tilt you. You're just completely gone from the face of the earth. Uh, and it is smart, right? It's getting away from the Cassiopeia, who admittedly with the Rod of Ages tier build does take a little while to scale up still, but is a huge point of strength for them and denies a lot of the Alistar's strength, right? Mm -hmm. Denies a lot of the potential team fighting strength from Vi as well. Uh, and can be the crux of the entire composition of Kanga if you have the Miasma there and then suddenly Samir is spinning around. But right now it's about money acquisition and much improved regardless from the Kanga squad. That it certainly is as we're back into the action. Not a long pause to say the least, which is always a promising sign. And we do check in with the overall gold and uh, well that really is the fruits of their labor. Invest a lot of time into the top lane and it is now Tron sitting firmly at the top. So the question is, can Tron actually survive in the next team fight running forward? Yeah. I think right now, if they are able to pull off a cohesive dive, the answer is yes. If you do have, you know, the Alistar, the Vi, the Ari, all these champions can really get into that back line onto someone like Cooper. But at the same time, you've got a Jax, you've got a Cassio. These champions love getting dived upon, even the Rakan to an extent, right? Pops the quickness, Grand Entrance is right on top of his carry, and they're quite all right. So this is definitely going to be a battle of execution. With the gold so close, this next Herald fight could really be a big decider in this game. I will say also, Tron, the ultimate Giga Chad player, sees a Jarvan, still goes Ghost, doesn't care. Yep. You know, a lot of jungle matchups when it was Jarvan v Olaf, you see the Jarvan, you're like, I kind of have to go Flash. Otherwise, I just get stuck in the cage in these skirmishes. Mm -hmm. Tron doesn't care. I mean, we saw Broken Blade in the LEC finals, right? Going Ghost Flash on Olaf, that's his normal go-to. Yeah. That's very solo queue, and I think it's very uh, coin flippy as well, but... Here we go, setting up towards this dragon, and we talked about the mid lane disparity and how strong Fido is. Look at the items, right? Not even a Mythic completed for Emphis compared to the full Rod of Ages and a Needlessly for Fido. Here we go, Skimmy. We certainly have. We've got the quickness, we've got the charm, we've got the damage potentially to land onto Bulldog, but he's got the Indomitable Will active right now, and there's the flash right afterwards. He hits the headbutt, oh. he's the ball, you're locked inside the turret, there's the Inferno trigger! And that's what a Samira can do. Look how different it is Ooh. when Samira is ahead. That was beautiful. Can we can we just mention that Bulldog killed Dante <laughs> in that fight? He headbutted an, a Jax with Counter-Strike active right on top of his AD carry, and he just got exploded. Bulldog hard out imposter in that situation. That was the most sus headbutt I have ever seen in my life. Dante is running Ghost, not Cleanse. And guess what? We have the pleasure of watching it one more time. Engaging on the Alistar is really risky to do because he mm. can just press R, right? It goes through crowd control. He'll be perfectly fine. Blue comes in, says, this is my moment. Bulldog says, hold up, <laughs> let me cook. Dante gets absolutely murdered. They just jump on top of him. The Inferno triggers the kill as the kills as well. And I'll tell you what, that's, that's something that I don't think they even need to VOD review that one. I think Bulldog's getting a slap on the wrist. No, he knows. I reckon the second he's done that, I reckon he's just realized he's absolutely doomed his AD carry. <laughs> I but can't believe that. We talked about exploding the game. It was a 1k gold lead 30 seconds ago. Now it's 4,000 for the team that arguably scales better. That they certainly do. Fido has been left unchecked. And he's got such a massive item advantage. You were only touching on that only moments prior, right? Uh, and it is still a case that Enfys will be lagging behind. Three items now, and Fighter really does have uh, what is his uh, paradise to try and play around on. Sometimes all it takes is a bit of level two cheese, right? To, to find the difference between a regular game that they'll be playing and what we saw from Kanga perhaps in that last one. Setting up for success, giving Fido space, giving Mayfun freedom as well. Emphasis isn't going to have permanent priority. And suddenly it's a completely different game. When you think back to the previous weeks of, of LCO, Ground Zero looked the most exposed and at their weakest when Emphis and Gooby were falling behind. Mm -hmm. So at this stage, 
We are looking at Dante, who's 0-2, and trying to see something crazy from him, right? This is also a very unforgiving comp to play if you fall behind in gold. You have Olaf, Vi, Alistar. If you're running in in a gold deficit and your engage isn't clean, you don't kill someone instantly, it is very hard to play. <laughs> As here we go, all 10. Oh my god, look at that blue jumping across the wall onto Gooby. And that's going to force the Blast Cone back. We are guaranteed that this next dragon is ours. So, third is taken. Second for Kanga. And uh, yeah, really very hard for Ground Zero to find any kind of way into that. They're all summoned as well. It's going to be going towards the bot lane. I think the most interesting thing we have to look at here, because we don't get many chances to genuinely explore this, is Kanga, you have a lead. You're in a winning position in this game. Your scaling is fantastic. You would say they have all of the tools to turn this into a game three in mm -hmm. this series. How do they actually go about that? How do they set up and close with leads that they have? And right now, they are looking at Tron. They are certainly looking at Tron and without a flash, how does he get himself out of harm's way this time? He's got the Ravenous Hydra, but stacks are lost and he is completely exposed. His team's just a little bit too slow to respond. And with the second Herald, Kango just giving a little bit of payback in the bot lane saying, you took two turrets topside, We'll do the same right here. And that is absolutely how you progress this game, how you start closing it out, right? Taking a kill into two turrets with that Rift Herald. I bet Tron is wishing he did take that flash now. But realistically, it's so hard to fight these Kanga champions. Look at Fido, fully stacked Archangel staff, almost having that Rod of Ages completely online as well. Just insanely hard to really find fights here. It's going to come down to vision. It's going to come down to can Ground Zero set up in an area first and potentially Bulldog finding a flank. It didn't go well the first time onto Fido, but can they be more cohesive? Can they blow someone up? Because realistically, I don't see them winning a straight on headbutt 5v5. Yeah, not anymore. It becomes extremely difficult to try and find even lethal damage onto a single target unless they have numbers advantage. So you'll see Ground Zero try and play the numbers game. Uh, but even in that last skirmish in the one prior, Blue's been permanently grouped with his team, is not willing to go for that split push pathway, make those mistakes. There'll be no risks taken by the Kanga squad. They group as five. Five good team fighting melee champions basically will be clashing. And only one of these teams has a 6,000 gold lead. At this point, I'm just looking at Fighter and saying, when's that Magi's coming out? It was 10 stacks in the dark seal. Yeah. You certainly feel like this is your game to fully control. To showcase your class and ability on it. The 6k gold lead, I mean, it's nothing to scoff at. No, and he's going Gargoyles as well as his third item, you'd have to assume, right? Going to be even more, yeah. even harder to kill in the downtime here. I do want to point out Blue going for Wit's End, second item here. Typically not something you'd see in a comp like this, but Hoobark getting caught out. Uh-oh. Oh, look at the CC layering. You can cleanse one, but can you get yourself out? Oh my god, for a second I wondered. Maybe the S ranking would have been there and an ult could have been pulled, but... So much attention, so much time knocked up in the air. And there's just mistakes you can't make. You know, that's 750 gold given over to Dante. That's the one player you don't want to give that to. You're ahead. You need to continue to stay ahead and snowball the game out well. You can't afford to get caught in mid lane like that and give any kind of in to Ground Zero, especially when you know where they were in the top side river. You've seen them clearing vision there. Those types of mistakes can't happen. Just a silly error, you know. Um, absolutely right, Zach. Shouldn't be happening in a game like this in what is potentially an elimination game. Going on to Varus, if you're a Ground Zero fan, you are certainly happy with how that turns out, right? Basically, almost completed his Rage Blade here. Finally going to be able to deal some relevant damage, and he's got the Ghost. He's able to turn on the damage later on, but Emphis, potentially unaware here. Has to be careful, does have a flash and does have an ultimate, oh. but gets locked in CC Paradise as well. I mean, the pounce potential from either side, it's devastating. It makes you wonder what the comms were for Ground Zero, because I feel like if you're in Emphis's shoes and you see the Cassie appear, you don't go up to the wave anyway. Walking That's, out of that bush especially. Yeah. I feel like that was a giant tell that something's a bit amiss, but you could see the Ground Zero were nearby, so perhaps he just assumed they'd based and that was Fido being greedy for one more wave. Uh, but gets punished, oh, oh. and uh, Tron is dead. Tron is dead off screen. So now this really will be an unfair fight. A 5v3 as the Baron is looked at. Gooby on a flank was trying to be sneaky, but will be spotted out and dealt with handedly. Back to the Baron they go. Dante across the wall is not lethality, so won't have the same amount of damage unless he gets uptime like this. Can't take Cooper down for free, however. Baron's still excited. Bulldog and Dante wondering what is our play, but surely now you've got to back off. There's no play here. Baron just going to be secured. Well done by Kanga, particularly in finding Gooby straight away. 
I suppose we're going to be seeing how top laners died here. They both <laughs> teleport mid. It seems like an honor duel. Uh, but blue wants it. Tron says, well, I have no choice. I mean, there's not much to that, is there? You've just teleported inside. It's a very top lane 1v1, isn't it? <laughs> Completely disregarding anything else that's happening on the map. So I'm anyway. going to right click blue <laughs> chat, meet me mid 1v1. Yeah. <laughs> but no I do want to mention, when you have a Casio, Plays like this become so much more threatening, right? It's 21 minutes, you get one pick, it's Baron. They're able to turn, they're able to find Gooby, like you said, Rusty. Mm -hmm. And instantly, it's just so hard for Ground Zero now. Third Dragon potentially going down. Blue has hit his items, a two item spike. Casio on three items. How do you kill Fido through that? Level 15. Stone plate barrier. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's impossible, isn't it, to try and take him down. And that's, that's the thing, the other fun interaction. This is a tanky Cassiopeia build. Cassiopeia with Jarvan is really fun because even champions that have dashes can't get out because you're able mm. to play frontline basically like a melee cast, chuck the W inside the Cataclysm, and they're just locked in. It's exactly where you want them to be, and it's just fish in a barrel. What a spot to find ourselves in now. Potentially Kanga able to rip this one back, bring us to that third game. It's been ever so elusive for such a long time here. Despite us having a very competitive split, it has been very clinical when it's come to getting ourselves through this group stage. But with four turrets taken to two and a Baron still active, the Kanga train continues to go straight oh, forward. Shinky. Gooby on a flank, Shinky's missed the mark, stopwatch has to be used, Mayfarm could be in trouble. Blue now pushing in bot wave, and Mayfarm might just expire very, very low. He's held his nerve with that Kanga but we are forcing that fight right now. There is the petrifying gaze, there is the kill, there is the retaliation from Tron. He's found what he needs, but Hoop is getting excited. He's found that first kill, he's got a second with the Inferno trigger active. Still keen to siege, still keen to push on through. Very dicey little skirmish there, potentially for Kanga, but just strong enough to persevere and get through. Dante untouched through all of that emphasis as well, but had no ultimate. And they're just able to slap them with their wallet and push an inhibitor in mid. And it's a bit of a botched engage, right? You saw the idea, Shinki having the flash, popping the quickness early. If they are able to find that onto Dante, he does just get one shot blown up and the game ends, right? You do have the stopwatch. Mayfun did have it in his inventory prior. But as we watch it once again, he's just short here, meaning Mayfun unable to get the follow-up. And look at the positioning of Fido and Hooper. They're not able to dive forward past this turret. Meaning Dante completely free. Emphis finding damage on the side and Fido he is just unkillable, standing here tanking everything. But this is a lot better fight for Ground Zero than they should be getting realistically at this stage in the game. Yeah, they were given a free chance to get an ace, to get five shutdowns to come back into this game. They were genuinely given a chance there, but not to be. Just so hard to take down that Cassiopeia for sure. Too many shields to keep him alive, even though he was locked in by his own jungler's Cataclysm. Yeah, I was watching her HP fluctuate, but just not seem to go much further down. It's a 10k lead now that we find ourselves at. Pick your minds up which bush you're going to cheese in. Oh, they've been spotted. No collapse though. Jack's going to go towards the bot side of the map. They are here as four and the outer turret is still alive. Not that I think it means too much at this stage in the game. The ground zero definitely routed. And look at Jax meanwhile in the bot lane. No one's answering him. He shreds turrets at this stage in the game with as much attack speed and the Divine Sundra. So eventually, someone from Grand Zero is going to have to answer. Tron can't 1v1 him. No. He has to just clear the wave, but he's going to go for the attack. Oh, Here we go. Oh, he's he's the committed. Ghost. Hold on. They're keen for another bash. He's oh, 1v1. Crazy. Picture in picture. That's what we're casting. But it is the B Blue winning out again. He ticks level 16 from that one. So now side lanes are in shambles. Grand Zero is a four man squad. Are still trying to fend off this top side assault. But that's exactly what you can't have happen now, right? Because there is literally no one to answer blue in the sideline. They're just gonna, Grand Zero are just gonna have to give up this outer turret. And as the waves continue to crash, Tron, once again, I mean, he didn't learn his lessons from the first time, opting in the 1v1 again, provided it was a bit closer because he goes in after Jax has used the counter strike. But even then, just look at the items. It's just too, too much to overcome. He was gapped by Ignite this time as well, for sure. Yeah. Right? Such a healing centric build, but uh, Blue simply presses his F key and pays respects to the death of Tron. Blue's not building tanky at all, though. He's going for straight damage, isn't he? Having gone for the Wits End now into the Spear of Shoujin as well. Yeah, tell, me about the, tell me about the Wits End, Max. You think it's immense value in this one? See, I like it for the damage, but I definitely don't think you're worried about AP at all yeah. in this game, which is why I was questioning it being built second. You know, you normally do see the Shoujin or the Zonyas, 
second. Yep. Um, perhaps he's thinking that, you know, maybe he's going to be auto-attacking Olaf that many times and it's going to be getting value. Uh, I really don't know, to be honest, but I think, you know, he's making it work. So if we're using results-based analysis, then... He's just better. Yeah. He's just better. I was thinking the Zonia's potentially as well. Mm. As, like, second or third item after the Shojin, but... Maybe he just likes the feel of the extra attack speed. It does feel nice. It does feel very good. Especially since he hasn't gone for the Triforce. So my question is, who kills Fido at this point in the game? Working towards their Rabadons now with two rods in pocket. That's a great question. 6 and 8 1k shut down. I think it's himself is the only person yeah. who can do it. Gets if he maybe runs onto Fountain or something like that. Fair. It's a pretty decisive moment in this game, isn't it? 10 seconds for the Soul Point as well as the Baron Overlap. And can Grand Zora contest either? Well, now's the question, right? Is your chance of winning the game better before or after they have Mountain Soul, right? Like, this game isn't going to get any better from this point. If your Grand Zero feels really weird, you're going to give up this. Maybe even give up the Baron, right? And then you just have to yeah. hope for a Hail Mary fight in your base. So, Kanga, they're so far ahead, they're just going to be able to right-click towards this Baron. And what can you really do, potentially? Look towards blue on the side. They're going to put yeah, four people to blue while they give away a Baron. It's their only opportunity that they're looking at right now, and they are committed to it. Yeah, this is a hard engage. It's a full 1v5. Can blue do anything? Can he take one to the grave with him? How much time can he buy as the team take Baron? First of all, out goes to Counter Strike. It's locking them all in place. He's living a fair bit, but oh, he's still no. quite squishy. Alistar he goes the way of Alistar of all people, so blue is cracking up, <laughs> and his team guarantees Baron. That's just, a, that's just a joke at that point. That feels like almost the game is just laughing at you, giving a shutdown to Alistar. Gooby's Alistar. laughing as well. I mean, Ground Zero, you saw, you saw Blue laughing, but so is the entirety of the Ground Zero roster. They know that it's... Well, if your only play in the playbook is to just try and take down Jax while you give away a Baron, well, he's going to be back in 25 seconds with a teleport anyway. So they're just trying to get what they can, really. Good to see they're still smiling, though, in this game. But realistically... Like you said, Rusty, as soon as that TP comes online, they're just going to sit Jax up in a side lane. Even in a 4v5 scenario, I don't think Ground Zero can actually win. I think they are going to have to look to maybe pick that overextended member once again. Seemingly Frozen Heart might be coming out next here for Blue. Obviously a lot of auto-attack damage from the side of Ground Zero. That would work wonders if a number 1v5 is rare as those occasions may be. Uh, would certainly find some merit into. Bulldog with the wraparound, denied by Shinky. Great awareness with the vision in that tri-bush. And now gonna be forced to flash away out of that Cataclysm. Having burnt an ultimate of his own as well. And this is a fully buffed up Kanga. Now looking to try and get an isolated kill onto Hooper. There is a stopwatch. He has a flash afterwards. He's already burnt the cleanse. And receives a ton of healing with the shield bow. Couple that with a redemption on his head as well. He pulls the trigger and he gets a double. You should not attack me like that. Lifesteal is just oh. a little bit too OP. Yeah, they play it really well to make sure that Hooper stays alive. Hooper was caught ultimately. That was the only thing Ground Zero could look towards, but redemption comes through. The reinforcements from Shinky is there as well. And now just a lone Emphas. The 03 Ari stares down the barrel of a loaded gun as they try and end the game here and now. And now I ask the question to Max, okay, what are the lotto numbers for this weekend? Because you may have predicted this one going to a game three. This is domination from Kanga. They've got a point to prove the critics out there. We will not go out with a stat pad that looks so, so against us. We are going to that third game for elimination. Max, they wanted to make sure your trip to to Sydney from Melbourne was worth its time. I they know. didn't want to give you a quick 2-0 series. I've got the thank you letter in the mail. <laughs> but what a game as well to go to a game three on, right? That looked so convincing. It was almost a complete inverse of what we saw in game one. And it really does beg the question of, you know, which team gets their way in draft and which team gets the early game? Because that looked completely different. Like you said, Rusty, all that happened, Mayfun ganks twice and it's complete flip of the script. So I have no idea Looks heading like into game three. Your boy Samira was pretty damn sharp that game. Hooper finally getting to pop off, even towards the end, when he almost got caught out of position, everyone just rotated and then it was just a big old W from there. Hashtag Kang Gang. They're not done yet. We go all the way to three. Yeah. Um, hopefully we get that third map today. All right, this is where things went a little bit awkward yesterday, but look, I'll, I'll just put it out there because I'm touching wood. Nothing's made of wood. <laughs> That's all right, here we go. As far as the viewers could tell, it's all wood. It's all wood. And he's yeah. like, I can't touch, the touch floor. wood. <laughs> Gosh, 
I've got something to tell you. It's all plastic. No, no, no I'm joking. Look, this game, though, uh, a very different affair. Ground Zero, a little bit of happy gaming from Tron up the up on the top side of the map. You know, there was multiple points where Blue was just doing so much work up there. That Herald getting the double charge in that series of events that you saw in the replay as well was something that definitely cracked open the map for GZ. But you know what cracked really open the map? Play of the day. That is play of, <laughs> play of the light of Bulldog's entire career right there. Yep, Kanga's play of the day, mind controlling Bulldog into uh, killing Dante. Very unfortunate. Not just unfortunate, I do feel like that was actually probably one of the bigger turning points in this game. And oh, that is yeah. the really, really <laughs> sad part. It's like that may have been the moment that Kanga were too far ahead to, to be dealt with. Uh, and the rest of the game was in reality, right? You were seeing some nice plays from, from Hooper, from Fido, as well as the rest of the team. But the biggest thing is that Mayfun's finding engage angles. The team of Kanga are working with Mayfun while he was finding those angles. And suddenly Kanga looked like a good team again. And it just constantly happens. So this third game, again, it doesn't even feel like it was entirely draft reliant. It was just play reliant and how they actually build up in the game. Now, my question is, how can Alistair have so much muscle but do such little damage. <laughs> he did enough damage to get the shutdown onto Jax right at the end of the game. <laughs> True. That was where the 1k came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Insane. Look, item builds, anything crazy going on. Look, we did mention when we were having that discussion about what Fido should lean towards earlier on today. With like the, the term cast was thrown out there. But did yeah. you think that he would pick it? Is it even in the meta at the moment or did he just make it work? No, it is. It's, it's definitely a pickable champion right now with the changes to Rod of Ages or the re-inclusion, I guess, of Rod of Ages and the changes to tier items. Yeah. Uh, Cassiopeia perfectly fits in the wheelhouse of pickable champions uh, and is so good for Fido because he does love scaling champions that win laning phase. That could not be better for him and yep. that's exactly what you're seeing. Scaling champions, scaled champions, it all kind of works for him, right? Do you, do, yes. Sure, he did that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> you didn't like that, did you? No. no. I, I was just thinking, like, I don't see the Renekton mid happening, and I <laughs> forgot about Cassia here in that moment. She's a snake. Yeah, she's a snake. She's got scales, just in case you guys were wondering. Uh, look, of course, that was an interesting one, and we all got our prediction wrong, except for this guy. So it's I reckon right he yet. knows something. Well, it's not right yet, but it's more right yes. than ours, which are just wrong, wrong yet either. Because we gave Kanga nothing in yes. our prediction. So we're all very sad. Uh, but someone else that's sad is Twitch chat because... 76% of them, I believe, voted for Ground Zero on that one. Mm -hmm. And Shambles. also, they probably haven't had their tweets up yet. But fortunately, from the fans is here to get those tweets up and show us those favorite legendary League of Legando skin dose. Uh, and Solan is here to say, is it cheating if I say all the Star Guardian ones? No, because you can have a favorite line, you know, yeah, a favorite brand line. of skin. No, I'm going to say it is cheating and you need to tweet your favorite at us right now. <laughs> yep, you need to do pick. it right now. I'm going to make your pick. Mm -hmm. We're running out of content. Cheater. Quickly, make your pick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Solan. Thanks, no, they're Celine. good skins. That's a very good skin, Mike. They're good. I feel like... It has um, to be Star Guardian Syndra because she's mummy. Pajama is that, Guardian Ezreal. Is that Malphite in the background? Don't look at me like that, Max. Like you wouldn't. <laughs> like you wouldn't what? Pick Syndra. Like oh, you wouldn't I, pick I Syndra. Syndra Elaborate. Like yeah. you wouldn't pick Syndra. I, did. I, <laughs> I, like, I, like, I, like, I like First Strike Syndra. <laughs> it feels really good. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, at the same time, we've got a few more skins to have a look at here. <laughs> Sorry, he just casually said yeah. Syndra's mummy, and it's just going to stick with me, all right? We can't move past just that. Move on who says, we, wait, who said Syndra's it? mummy? How did I miss uh, that? Oh, forget about it, mate. Oh, all right, moving on. Uh, James Oliver at James Destined on the Twitter sphere. Not Blitzcrank skin because he. All right, the skin's called Not Blitzcrank because he's disguised. People don't realize it is Blitz and I that's, don't see hooks coming. That's not a legendary. No. I'm pretty sure that's a 975. Yeah. It's a legacy skin. It's a great skin. It is. Well, he might have, you know, some people have dyslexia, legendary, legacy. You, yeah, I could see it. If you skim read it. RIP the Kings. Hey. Eh? So, James, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, good skin choice still. You failed to discredit the, the choice. assignment, but bonus points for the good skin selection. Hey, I think that's pretty good. What are you now, ask for? quick conversation going into game three. What do we want to see differently? Is it just was was that just a GZ skill issue? Was there just a few too many little things that went wrong for little hiccups they made that allowed Kanga to run away with that lead? Like that one big one in particular, of of course. Uh, but. 
Mm. I think they recognized, like, there was a lot of creativity from Bulldog, and I think that was good. Uh, regardless of the headbutt, we don't really need to talk about that too much. We all know what happened. Yeah. But for me, the the biggest factor, if I was to pick one thing right now, it was Emphis, who felt completely different to what we've seen from him in the previous games, in his, like, last four games that he's played. He was making mistakes, he was being preyed upon, he was being caught, and it feels like perhaps when Emphis is behind, he is very easily targeted. So that might just be a playbook that is propped up for Kanga because they just saw how successful that is. So that needs to change for Ground Zero side if they want any kind of success in this game. Perhaps more attention towards Emphis and his success. Okay, well, get that attention. Uh, put it in a bottle of Dare. Shake it up. Swig it up. Swig it down, right? Any little sippy. Quick sip. No, any it's a, little sippy. It's a we'll save, some, save it for later, of course. Uh, but it's time for a break. Ladies and gents, go grab those dares and we'll see you for game three just after this. Fighters, here we go, Skimmy. We certainly have. We've got the quickness, we've got the charm, we've got the damage potentially to land onto Bulldog, but he's got the Indomitable Will active right now, and there's the flash right afterwards. He hits the headbutt, oh. he's the ball, you're locked inside the turret, there's the Inferno trigger! And that's what a Samira can do. Look how different it is Ooh. when Samira is ahead. That was beautiful. Can we, can we just mention?
the LCO is back. Everyone's whack. This man is Mac. And he's going to Dream Hacks. Exclamation oh. Dream Hack in chat if you want to make sure you're there for all the LCO goodness. It is actually Max. What was your name again? Bumper? Bumper. It was yeah. Bumper, but we've Just gone for that back game. to the individual. Yeah, you, well, Bumper was a great caster. I know. Yeah, I reckon we should get him back in for game three. What do you reckon? Yeah. Upcoming talent, eh? Mm -hmm. One of the best in the region for sure. But of course, yeah, exclamation stream hack in the chat. LCO.gg forward slash dream hack ticks with an X if you want to go straight to the page rather than type an exclamation. Maybe your keyboard's broken and you can't do the exclamation, so you can't get through the link. Hopefully someone else does it in Twitch chat. Twitch chat, type it in, please. Thank you. Uh, and buy those tickets to the Saturday 29th April because I want to cuddle you. I want to get some photos with you. I, seeing you guys down there last time was amazing. Everyone running through the halls, everyone having fun. What? I want to cuddle you. It's just the opening. Hey, reason why you should come to DreamHack, you and me. This is the reasons why. Hug, Number hug. one, I want to cuddle you. Yeah, <laughs> I reckon that'll sell tickets. Yeah. Cuddling. <laughs> We're all a family here at DreamHack. Okay, man. Uh, yeah. If very you had a League of Legends man. like onesie, a plushie, a onesie cosplay. What is going on? Uh, he's just a very huggable Preview. man. I mean, what just, onesie would huggers. it be, Mac? We're huggers in this building. What were you saying, sorry? If you were like cosplaying <laughs> at DreamHack and I like, had like a onesie league themed, like what kind of champion would it be? What are we thinking? Braum. Shirtless, like moustache, okay. big shield, covering the nipples. You could, no, he could do I that. I reckon you could. He eh? could definitely yeah, you could be a Braum. Braum. Okay. Yep. Let's have a quick look here at the draft history as well. Moving into game three. We'll get this conversation back on track. Get away from DreamHack and talk about what... Is it going to be ran back? You're really You're trying to get fire. that one. Hey. Are we back on track? I think we are. Game one, I mean, uh, absolute turnaround really from game one to two. I think from both sides in terms of how they approach the draft. I think Ma um, Max at the top of the show was like saying he felt it was very draft heavy. Do you still feel that going into game three or is it very much performance and momentum based now? I think it's a bit of both. I think that Kanga definitely looked like a completely different team with a draft that suited them, right? I think that the really easy engage tools that they had from their bot lane, from their jungle, made it really good. And I think the biggest change for me was Mayfon, mm. right? I think that he was able to be the aggressor, get stuff done early, and then you get Fido ahead in that matchup, and it's just, it's just game over from there. He knows how to carry a game, and I think that Fido especially, I know particularly that he is vocal when he's on this Casio. When he's got those six kills, he is calling the game, he is running the shots. I said it the wrong way around, but you guys get what I mean. Calling the shots yeah. and running the game. Yeah. We know yeah. what you mean. Same thing. Absolute same thing. But look, same time. Are we going to get the same thing? GZ going back to the red side. Mm -hmm. So looking to get that counter pick in play. Now, though, that Kanga go back to blue side. They've had a chance to, you know, have a good draft, get the motivation cranking. Going back to the blue side, getting those prior picks, do you think that priority is going to change now that they know what has worked for them? And they got away with a first pick, Samira, on red side. So I don't mm. know how much priority they're going to consider putting towards the, the Varus if this does work. I'm very curious where they choose to go because give the Varus, have a Jarvan composition, it felt very comfortable for them. I uh, genuinely not sure exactly what it'll be that they will first pick this time around because mm. uh, it feels like the draft has progressed in a way where this third game could be anything. Literally anything. Literally anything. They're not banning, they're not banning Maokai. Sedge first nope. pick, Vi so first pick Maokai's is most potential. likely. Mm -hmm. If you want an AP option in the jungle, still gives you the uh, hard po point of engage, non-committal like a Vi. Do you so think that they could play a Mocha or a double of Thpretho? Oh, I do love a fancy little Mocha. I really do. I bet you you guys love a dead fan vote to get your Twitch points in up there. Thank you. Hey, did you dab? No, you just no. double on You just double no, on it. We're 2023. Oh. Get real. Why not give us hey. a dab? Surely. Up there, Twitch points in. Uh, what was the... Uh, you said it was like 65-ish percent to GZ just before? It was... Uh, I think it was 76. 76-24 was the last game from memory. Kanga point putters. You just got a lot. I want to see him back on Kanga. I want to see the GZ points that remain back on GZ. I want to see how close we can get this dare fan vote because this game is anyone's bloody game at the moment. Yeah, it's all up for grabs. And, and I suppose this is really when it gets the most exciting. It kind of... Gives us what we almost were deserved last night, right? That game free of the tension of very decisive victories on either end of the stick. And you yeah. come into this one, you're thinking that Grand Zero had all the momentum. Uh, for Kanga to pull it back in such a fashion after the crushing in game one, I think really bodes well for this. I'm just, yeah, very, very curious about this blue side priority, given that, yeah, Maokai's been let through, that Zeri's been denied from one side, but it hasn't really been played by Hooper yet. And it still feels like the most broken champion. And we have seen Hooper play before. I always remember that time, I think it was Order versus Direwolf's last split when he was just dancing around them at the Dragon Pit 1v9 with Yumi. So 
Uh, surely Hooper's got that within him. Well, let's see if he's dancing with two left feet, two right feet, or the right amount of feet. Champ Select's ready. Yes. Let's draft and uh, let's see what happens. Actually, it's them to ban away. Yeah. This area in their own hand. Okay. And if, no okay. way. What? Okay. Okay. You know how I said I didn't think it would be first pick. I didn't think about this. Okay. That is really yeah, anything. That, that is anything. anything. That that's that's crazy. I. Uh, most important things here is that Tron's champions are all still up and available, right? So something that was banned away in game one was Ariel from the Scion. I don't think he cares because he's picked Fiora. Uh, very curious to see what they will do now in response, Ground Zero. This is still very much potentially an Annie composition. Uh, the Annie Sejuani worked wonders for them, but now they just need to be aware that there is still the Cassiopeia and things like that that will exist on the opposing side. Look at Gooby. He's, um, he's vibing. He's vibing. Well, he's, it's actually the unhappy octopus on his head. You know oh, how that flips out? and can it, be the happy one as well. Right, Tien has the same one, I believe. Yeah. Yep. So it is going to be the Annie coming out here. And Kanga really throwing down the gauntlet, right? I mean, the Fiora for Blue, for those of you who don't know, basically his signature pick, right? He was known for that when he came up in solo queue. He was known for that all throughout his amateur career and now into the LCO. Um, as we see here, once again, Fido having a bit of fun with Emphis almost, hovering the two champions that he is known for. They're just picking their own champions. This yeah. Kanga draft is you, good luck, guys. Like, actually, the coach just said, just pick what you like. Yeah. It's, we're going in order. Like you could have first picked the Sejuani into a Fiora composition, so you had a really good 2v2, but they're just going to go Fiora Jarvan. No carries locked in yet from the Ground Zero side. That could be an anti support still. You don't even know what you're dealing with. And so, again, the obvious choices here, Ground Zero say, well, we know how this is going to play out. We can kite with our composition mm -hmm. potentially. So Annie could be with Ezreal now, mm. and then we could just have a mobility-based mid laner if we wanted to. And just try and skirt around with range in this team fight. I actually like this from Kanga though, like to be honest, in a situation like this where it is win or go home, you want your players to be absolutely comfortable and Blue and Fido on, without a doubt, their most popular, their most proficient champions, I'd be scared playing against either one of those, let alone both in tandem, right? So it really comes down to what a Ground Zero going to play, because into Fiora, you normally want to go something that has a bit of range, like a Jace, maybe a Cannon. Cannon definitely not the pick this game. But I don't think Tron plays the Jace very much, right? Tron isn't yeah. is more more of a tank player. So Blue has really thrown down the goal and said, what are you going to play that can beat my Fiora? Might even consider something like the Gangplank. We'll see where he chooses to go. Uh, the interesting thing for me here as well is if we're going to go down this pathway, Max on Kanga just playing what they are comfortable with, are we just going to get like a Philios Thresh 4-5? Yeah. Just that's the comp. <laughs> like We're just picking what sure. we're the best at. We know Ooh. Hooper is an Aphelios player, one and, of his best champions. And it's good into Ezreal too, right? Your yeah, lane, your lane's exactly. really nice. I think you might have caught it, Rusty. I think that the Aphelios, if we look at the AD carry bands coming through, Varus gone, Sivir gone. Realistically, Hooper has been into default to that again. Nah. And nah. Okay against Fiora in lane, definitely fine. You do have the range advantage. You are able to really bully her yeah. out a little bit. But in terms of s scaling, you know, definitely hard to play against the Fiora in the later stages. And here we go, Rusty. He's also got the uh, the plated steel caps for a double physical top jungle, mm -hmm. which is not a bad idea there for Tron is usually a break point where a lot of Nars start to run away with lanes early. Uh, Fiora obviously permanently has kill threat though. So we'll wait and see what Kanga chooses to go for as their fifth pick, because at this stage, you're just trying to predict what they like at the moment, not what their composition's gonna be, because they've unironically all picked their own champion. There will be no swapping. No. And Aphelios Lulu. So this is a very clear composition for Kanga here, right? Front to back, you put your Fiora in a side lane, get some work done, and it's a very clear win condition. We talk about making the game really nice and easy for yourself, right? You are so happy with these champions running in towards you now. What is Emphis gonna fifth pick? And it's gonna be the Victor, another scaling champion. You know, likes to go up against the short range of Cassiopeia, but very vulnerable against the Jarvan as the game goes on. Yeah, certainly is going to be uh, going to have to really keep our eyes on that mid lane, especially at level two once again, like we saw for that potential gank in the mid lane. It certainly seemed like a place for them to bully in that second game, and Emphis behind certainly might not be anywhere near as a big of a threat. But it does feel curious to me that you've got such a composition where, yeah, you will have a Fiora scaling and split pushing, that the four man is terrifying enough in isolation to be a bit of a menace, but then Grand Zero 
<laughs> Certainly have a fair bit of mobility and, uh, you know, CC themselves to try and disrupt that flow, right? It's not going to be as simple as, you know, just flag and dragging in. There's going to be knock-ups. There's going to be almost a desire and necessity, I suppose, in a way for Tron to be unlocked from that lane and, you know, find more success in the team fights to sort of overcome what is going to be the strength in those side lanes. And that is the one downfall of Kanga's comp is the lack of engage, right? You know, besides perhaps a Gravitum Ultimate or obviously the Jarvan, you don't really have many tools to pull the trigger. On the other hand, you've got a Sejuani with no melee champions, no one that's really going to be diving with you, maybe besides a Meganar. So realistically, it's two compositions that you're hoping the Victor, you're hoping the Ezreal can play at their range, you're hoping they can really kite out this Cassio and Fiora. Yeah, I mean, f uh, I like what Kanga's composition does, especially when Ground Zero are going towards them. Mm. Uh, but that's not really how Ground Zero's comp is going to play out as well, right? Like ultimately a Victor and an Ezreal do just chill back. The thing that still sticks out to me, and I am going to always say this, so it's probably already on record a hundred times, I just think that Fiora is trash in Oceania. Mm. Not that Blue can't play Fiora, Blue is a very good Fiora player, but the way teams play around Fiora locally is not good enough to be able to win games. Yep. They usually just get stuck building Hullbreaker and Tilt Splitting. I've never seen one work and really thought that Fiora won the game. So I think Kanga really need to prove their value and decision to go for the carry on blue, which is what he absolutely loves to play. And if we're looking, you know, later stages of this game, there's always going to be that Victor who has the TP able to match the Fiora in the side lane, right? Fiora can never get anything done in a side lane versus the Victor unless she's got Baron, right? Or Hullbreaker or both even. So definitely some answers there, even for the inevitable split push that will come out. But with everything on the line, we are onto the Rift. Saving that grace will be, though, the fact that there is no globals, right? Like a GP or like a Pantheon, right? To really lock down this uh, Fiora as easily as it has been shown in the past. But mm -hmm. it is a valid concern, right? That, um, you know, you're, you're locking in all your mains almost in a game where your tournament life is uh, on the line. So I guess you, you go out with a, a bow of dignity, a case that you've almost removed as many excuses um, from, uh, okay. from the possibility. So Grand Zero with a pretty quick adaptation here when you actually look at it, they have placed three wards around the map, three mm -hmm. of them in the river. Uh, they are expressly looking for a level two Jarvan gank. Which does mean if Jarvan goes for a, a full camp clear into gank, there will be no wards on the map. There's something to keep in mind for Kanga's side. We'll see how prepared they are to play and if Mayfan really wants to try and hard force that level two play again kind of opens the door for Ground Zero to play accordingly. Looking like he will be a bit more heads up here, but already... This is the thing about this matchup, right, is if you mess up the spacing for even a second as the Nah, it completely swings, right? Fiora getting level 2 prior, gonna mean she has control over this wave here. The this old 50-50 matchup... vital proc too. Oh, it sucks. It, that was the worst part about playing top lane when you're playing against the Fiora. You have a 50% chance to just lose the lane basically instantly, but this lane, you know, early, very early levels, Fiora should be completely fine. It sort of starts to heat up as Nar gets towards that level 6 mark, but Mayfun... How's he managed that? <laughs> That's genuinely impressive. Pixel off. He has really outplayed himself with that vision time. Look at Gooby just waiting. He knows. Gonna cry heads right now here. He's gonna be Emphis first to respond as the stun connects into Mayfun, flag and drag, and a flash that will not need to be burnt. I think Gooby was trying to hold his Q to interrupt yep. the flag and drag, but just not able to react quickly enough there. Could have been a first blood going down there. As a nice read, and yeah, Mayfun Sweeper missing the ward in that pixel bush by an inch. Almost an impossible amount of uh, pixels between him and the Sweeper finding what he was after. What this does mean though, is you're seeing a Sky's Bloom come through, is that Gooby's not ganking, he is one HP. Tron is also extremely low in this top lane. Uh, and just a quick spot check on the wave. He should be okay to recall and walk back here or teleport back here perfectly fine. But 13 CS is such a, a dismal amount for being able to purchase anything. There's mm. nothing that he's going to gain from that. Just forced back to base by Blue playing the lane out really well. And this is a really nice flow and effect from that mid lane play that Mayfun made, right? Him getting chunked out, having to go back to base means he's not able to hover his bot lane so they can crash the wave. And if you look at the bot lane, wave right now. Dante and Bulldog have been able to freeze this. They've been able to go back and their wave's going to be in a really good position when they get back to the lane as well. So multiple consequences mm. for Mayfun just missing that sweep award. 
So he is going to help Fido get a reset here. Yeah, and speaking towards this as well, uh, just a quick check in with the runes for mid lane. Emphis doesn't go for the first strike victor, which is one of the more common pathways. He does go the other way, which is airy, which is so much more lane power and control. Mm -hmm. Means you can sit there and, and every E cooldown just harass the Cassiopeia, who is quite predictable and easy to hit. Can't get boots in laning phase as well, so it does take the maximum damage from that. Uh, and is able to have a bit more presence just in that 1v1 in laning phase, something that he certainly didn't have in game number two. Good tracking there from Gooby as he uses another Scryze to reveal the complete parving as to where Mayfarn will be. Great heads up, especially for their bot lane, the likes of uh, an Ezreal and Annie that want to make sure they do not fall behind. They want to make sure they power spike first before the likes of the crit of Philios comes online. But a big affinity towards this mid lane. I mean, are we surprised at this point, given that Fido took over the show on this Cassiopeia? A flash gravity field and a stun to follow up. Then there's the headbutt, the knockdown, and the stun passive after, and a first blood going the way of Grand Zero. Perfect. Absolutely perfect there, Bulldog. Pap showing Aladoric there that you're meant to press your Q after you flash, landing the stun. <laughs> And that's huge as well, right? Fido blows his own flash. Flash not having to be invested from Gooby or Emphis, right? So you look at a level 6 for this Sedge 1, it could potentially be a repeat. Yeah, 100%. Really well done by the side of Grand Zero. Bulldog roaming seems to be one of the major keys for them as well, finding those kills yesterday as well. When you think about it against the Chiefs, it was the Rakan plays in mid lane with Ignite that were finding them their best point of success. It's giving Gooby an extra accessory in the playbook as bot lane. Could be a Gravitum Q. Here it is, a two-man Gravitum into an instant polymorph and a flash away afterwards. Dante burning! And it's going to fall on down. Hooper finds it. That's your best case scenario. And that's a massive wave that's going to get denied. And a perfect combo there. They use the Graviton, they use the Root. Shinky polymorphs, meaning Dante can't flash. He can't use that E. And Mayfun using the E flash. Not able to get out. Bulldog potentially looking. The base will go out, but, you know, double sums from Dante and he still goes down. So. A nice trade back from Ground Zero to equalize. Emphis looks like he's just going to pop the ultimate in mid to try and force himself for free. Reset knowing that he's going to have no reinforcements from his jungle and nor the bottom lane having any kind of control or tempo there. So it felt like he wanted to just hit the ult to reset his wave. Uh, but will be perfectly fine if he sits all the way back. Remember it is a flashless level 4 Jarvan. There's no chance he gets locked in a cage and still has that flash that you highlighted before as well. But this does feel like a bit of time spent uh, and time wasted on the Kanga side, just to uh, enable Fido to exist. But I'm liking this increased action towards the mid lane we've seen from both supports and jungles from either team, right? Really realizing that whoever is able to get unlocked in this matchup, if we're able to keep Fido down, that prevents him from doing what he did last game and really taking the game into his own hands. One thing I do want to point out is this top lane. I think last time we checked, there was a significant CS lead for Blue, who has just been finding the better of Tron in this early game, you know, with that sheen, with that grasp and the Scorch setup you're running. If you get hit by Qs, it's just impossible for Nada to poke uh, Fiora out of lane, as we already see a 10 CS lead piled up. So Blue, definitely one of the players who can win lanes, but can he translate that into something more meaningful is the question. That's become the question, what kind of uh, build will we get coming out of the Fuhrer? It has, for the mm. most part, been relegated to the whole breaker, but would love to see it work in I a straight fighting fashion. Wouldn't be surprised to see Gooby do this red buff, get six, and consider a bot gank. I know there is a cleanse there from the Aphelios, but he's flashless, they can layer crowd control. Uh, is Chinky's going to have a look, see the red's not there, he's actually, I think, maybe just seen it pushed out of the bush, so they know he's here. But Gooby does tick over to six, just going to do the Drake. Yeah, we're prone in the bot lane. Nick has started one up quite easily. Blue going to continue to chip on way at this tower as well. Already found two plates, which is your best case scenario. See the most uh, experience in the game. You'd imagine be close to the most gold as well. Mayfun not interested in even going for this dragon. Going to do some counter jungling of his own. Pings on towards this Herald here. Going to look like a bit of a trade as we saw. Tron's Mega did just time out, right? So he is going to be quite... Useless, <laughs> that feels like the wrong word, but definitely not providing as much as a Fiora um, at this stage with his Mega Bar so low. So looking like Ground Zero, sticking towards their plan, you know, sort of leaving Tron on an island to fend for himself, playing towards that bot lane, getting those dragons, and really playing off Emphis, who is the point of power so far in this game for Ground Zero. Yeah, I mean, 100% the game plan's going to be push mid, use that to go somewhere else. Uh, you already saw that just happen from Fido as well. And 
I feel like there was a world where you see the, the Nar go to mini form. You had so much tempo in mid that you could have potentially dove. Mm. Uh, but they choose to take the safer pathway, right? The free objective is theirs. And just like that, they are in a, an equal position, if not slightly advantageous. Still really good scaling for both teams, though, so no distinct advantage. Uh, even, you know, five to 500 to 1,000 gold leads. I was going to say before there, Max, how do you assess this as the Nard? Is this a situation we've been seeing a, a lot of tears and a lot of uh, coals as well? Is this a situation where you almost relegate yourself to saying that this lane is feeling a little bit doomed? Might as well just farm up a storm and try and become more relevant in the team fight? I think Nard definitely wants to get towards his Triforce as soon as possible. That is really the point where you can actually threaten the Fiora. Like if she messes up, she queues in, she doesn't get that reset, you are able to run her down, right? You get so much movement speed based off your hyper passive, based off the Trinity Force as well, mm -hmm. that you certainly can sort of start to fight back more in this lane. Um, but so far, right, looking at the CS, 14 up for blue right now, definitely being able to hold this down. But all in all, this lane again, not really expecting too much to come out of it, you know, besides maybe a CS lead and some plates, right? I don't think either jungler is particularly wanting to invest too many resources. The Nar way too mobile for the Jarvan to get on top of, and I think really the only way you're going to find a kill, like Rusty said, is with a dive on a sack wave. But here we go. Spotted Mayfire. him. He actually did just get spotted by the vision that Ezreal ult provided. You could see immediately a, a vision ping was placed mm -hmm. on top of him on the mini map. So Mayfun has to disengage. A tragedy of timing, at the very least, for that, as the Ezreal's you know 30 seconds away from having that flash up and available. Emphis should be Emphis. hyper aware that he was bot side of the map. What? It's yeah. just not aware. Not going to get locked in place though. He's going to hold his flash for such a long time. He can't even use it now. There's a petrifying gaze for good measure. Shinky rocks up just to give him a high five. And yeah, that just seems like a calamity of errors, but uh, Kango won't mind. They get to summon the Herald. And that's one of the mistakes that in a game three, you really can't be making, right? Because we see now that the Herald is being dropped. This is gold onto Casio in addition to the kill. That's going to be coming down, so Fido, who once was behind, definitely feeling really good, and like you said, Skimmy, they saw him on the vision in bot lane. Might have been a miscommunication, might have been Emphis too, being too focused on the lane, but really can't afford too many slip-ups like that. I mean, my guy 100% wasn't even moving while the Jarvan was flag dragging because he was focused on hitting the laser, so... Certainly an odd situation with how that played out does mean the 11 minute Rod of Ages can be purchased by Fido either way. He's done it again, hasn't he? I mean, 10 minutes last game, 11 minutes this one. Certainly in a position to take over the game again. Right at the moment, it is Hooper with the most gold. And his chance is going to use his ultimate to push this one in. It's funny how we've gone past the point of thinking Nala's got an impactful ult until he's in a team fight. Just chucks it out <laughs> every wave anyway now. No one even flinches. It's fun though, definitely having to rely on your Mega in this matchup to stack really big waves and, and get them in. But as we take take stock of what's happening here, the items may find sitting on the completed Gore Drinker, and like you mentioned, Skimmy, the Rod of Ages coming out now for Fido, so able to stick around in this lane forever with that plus the Tier of the Goddess combo. And Hooper on his pocket of Phalios, as always, staying 10 CS per minute. Oh, great flash away there from Shinky, as the Glacial Prison would have collided otherwise. Just gets out of harm's way, no stun, just a slow. Uh, just, again, like a little bit disconnected from the Ground Zero squad. Oh, Emphis does have that flash, I mean, not burned it before, but if Fido gets it, he might as well goes down again. Oh, he's flashed out to nowhere! What was that? He's dead for rights, it's a little bit too easy for Kanga to prey upon in the mid lane. And that's a big sore spot that they are certainly exploiting. Flash instantly matched! And this Cassiopeia is one, well, just unleashed, I'm stunned. <laughs> it's very hard to watch a fight like that as the spectators right we are, right, with perfect vision and understand anything that just went on and why that actually just happened in a pro game. But wow. a real, real shame from Emphis. Back-to-back -back errors, 100% from the mid laner of ground zero, but the team tries to help him this time. And it goes from bad to terrible. And now suddenly this game, I mean, Emphis doesn't go with his team, the team doesn't come with him, he's not protected, he's not supported, yeah. he gets bush cheesed, and then flashes on the spot, and just stands still and presses S, gets grounded, and his mum literally said, go to your room. And look at Fido here, he flashes even before he sees Bulldog flash, he just knows he's going for someone, whether that be Gooby, or whether that be Bulldog, but here, once again, Fido, it was looking like Ground Zero were keeping the reins on him, but now 2-1-0, up 12 CS. He is unleashed on this Cassiopeia. 
Maybe it really is as simple as just ignoring what Draft has to offer and just locking in your champions roll for roll. No swapping, no need. Kanga in a third game here, feeling inspired after their second performance. Comes it might be all it takes, but the uh, next dragon has been picked up here by Grand Zero. They've certainly got a dragon point to play towards. Don't tell me it happens again. Yeah, so at least there was a control ward to protect him this time. <laughs> he didn't hover the walls, so no sweeper, but here we go. Terminal. Just in his face. I think he's in his head rent free at the moment, you know? And you know, one big thing that we did kind of touch on earlier, but I want to reiterate is just the feeling of momentum in a best of series. Something that these teams don't get much experience doing, first and foremost. But you win a single game in a squad like Kanga, who had an 8% win rate in the LCO prior to this. Suddenly they've got to win, suddenly they're feeling themselves, right? And it starts to become more of that scrim mindset where they can play their best version of League of Legends, not feeling the stage pressure as heavily. Sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah, you're getting those reps in for sure, especially when you're playing big sets uh, in those scrim blocks. You've got repetitions behind you. And Kanga, at this point, really haven't put too much of a foot wrong. Four kills to one, another Herald going their way. Really has been the trading, right, of uh, different strategies. We want that instant injection of gold through turret plates and through kill pressure that balloons into turrets taken, but Grand Zero clearly trying to play for a sole point here. And I think a lot of the issue now is just, it's so hard for Victor to actually play anywhere up from basically beyond his turret, right? Having no flash, we talked about how important it was to be able to get mid push for both of these teams. But Victor has just been preyed upon by this duo of Mayfan and Fido, and he's really not been able to walk up. So now we finally see Gooby, finally see Bulldog around this mid lane, trying to get some vision so the Emphas can really start pushing. Because so far, Fido has just had his way with this lane. I think certainly that would be the point that I would look at as a difference. Bulldog has been exceptional with his roaming, his timing to try and be elsewhere, and especially in a champion like the Annie, very similar to his Rakan performance as well. Ability to try and act as a second jungler for that gank. They really need to make sure they can take down Fido, but at the moment, Shinky protecting as well. Yeah, they're just going to be hovering around mid lane. It's the most important place on the map at the present moment. That's the thing, you're seeing Bulldog get active, you're seeing good moves in mid lane, but we haven't seen Bulldog and Gooby working on the same screen as often as we did yesterday. Uh, even the play towards bottom is Bulldog. Yeah, great hex flash across the wall. Oh, agonizingly close to landing the Sedge ult as well. Once again, Shinky eludes it with another flash on CD. And Blue finally takes that top tier one with a Herald granted to his lane. Yeah, and this is the side lane threat we were talking about, right? You put this Fiora in, especially not so just sitting on components right now, not having the full Triforce. And so far, both Sejuani ultimates, I think the most recent ones, have been thrown at Shinky. He's just been able to get out. That's really all it is, but here Ooh. we go. It certainly is. The grand challenge has been set. Look at Tron just be absolutely tapped from every <laughs> single vital. That leap was so clutch. But still, does Blue decide to go for more? He's taken one turret, he's looking Mid for a second. Bottom. Pooper was getting dived, but he's found two. And the defense is exceptional in this bot lane. Yes, to have been found by Emphis. He certainly needed that, but you've given an Aphilios a triple kill. And Crown Zero try and make that play themselves as well. They see the Herald top lane, they see the Fiora pushing, they say we dive bottom, we make something happen. And when you watch this kick off Fido, no flash. So they put a big target on his head. They say this is what we're after, but the reinforcements are so fast. And Fido bucks the trend, goes aggressive, gets the stun on Zadante and just survives. He is so tanky. And that's all you need, time. Hooper gets in, time was on their side. He's able to get all of the kills here and a nice little flag drag flash knockup makes sure that there's no flash from Emphis. And then Hooper gets a triple. But this is huge. I mean, across the board, they're losing on both sides of the map. That top lane 1v1, two turrets going down. Tron almost getting solo killed. And then meanwhile, you mentioned it, Skimmy. Aphelios for Hooper. Four and zero. Just picked up the Bloodthirster. Playing against an Ezreal. Doesn't matter if you tank any Qs anymore. He's got the Bloodline, you presume, and the Bloodthirster now. And oh. there we go. You can't flash that one. <laughs> Third time lucky, eh? <laughs> they will eventually land that Glacial Prison. And, uh, you know, put Shinky down. But back to your point, I mean, look at the item disparity between these 80 carries, and it's meant to be the tier item spike first. Yeah, it's just absolutely grim now. The Gale Force as well, providing so much value, when realistically the only thing you have to consistently dodge is the Sejuani ultimate. Even if he doesn't, he's got the cleanse, right? So if he can play out of the range of that Annie, doesn't get stunned there. And we but keep panning back the top lane for a reason, right? Yeah. Because Blue has been relentless in this lane. It feels like Tron is genuinely suffering in this matchup. Even though it is staying stable at 20 CS difference, two turrets have fallen. Now there's pressure to inhibit a turret. There's no space left for Tron to work with. And I think space is the really big point there as well, because even though Blue isn't going to be breaking this turret anytime soon, 
It's that entire quadrant of the map that Kanga now have access to, right? That's Blue's playing ground. Tron is never really able to walk in. That means Blue can do stuff like this, right? He's able to walk down freely and not lose anything. Also remember, for everyone at home, this patch, you've got the overheal changes. The Aphilios who's rushed a blood dose, so 700 HP shield sitting on yeah, him permanently, and has the red weapon. Which is one of watching. the things that makes it crazy. Shinky gives him the shield as well. It's another whole health bar at that point. It's just kind of criminal. Blue will be face checked. Feels like one of the biggest moments in the game for Ground Zero. If they choose to fight this one, it'd be very difficult to do so. They could potentially threaten the soul point if they were going to go for that one. But instead, they're just going to pressure in mid lane. Still means that everybody's grouped up right now, and Kanga. They have a decision to make. Yep, they certainly do. So Blue jumps in, tries to keep them interested for the meantime. Mid tier one falls on down. There is the flag and drag. There is the knock up. Tron knocks back one. It's only onto Blue, not the target they wanted. Bulldog takes out Fito. That looks good in isolation, but Tron's dead. That's five now for Hooper. The Aphilios is back and swinging. Jarvin gets another relentless taking down Emphis. He's got a target. He's got a snipe. There is the double. Make it a triple. Can we get ourselves a quad as Gooby's forced to flash away? And Blue says, don't worry about it, mate. Kill secure. But the vital was not enough. And Baron has literally just spawned. Hooper has the white gun. He is going to be shred through this. Skimming, that's not just the dragon. That's not just the team fight. It's going to be the Baron as well. This is an elimination game as well. Keep that in mind. The loser of this is out of split one of the LCO and Kanga. Are starting to look the goods in this third game. You watch how this fight breaks out one more time. And it's quite simply a corridor that Ground Zero locked themselves into. Miasma they can't walk through. And then now that is separated from the rest of the team, and meanwhile Mayfan has the angle, doesn't quite do the math here, but it doesn't matter because Bulldog still is locked in trying to help the rest of his team. Simple stuff here for Kanga. Just look at Hooper, completely untouchable, right? In the back line, no threat in a corridor where it's just a little bit too easy for a Moonlight Vigil to be uh, he landed. He's now 7-0 and 1. His pocket pick is proving why right now, and the Baron, you know, this is a composition for Kanga. We talked about side laning. Fiora now having that Baron. It was already so hard for Nar. Add a Baron into the mix. That inhib tower is all but good as gone. And we've evolved so much further than the level one TikTok cheese, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> and Filios, that really is going to matter in this game as Blue now feels the raffle split pushing 1v3. Oh, great stun! An even better follow up. It does yep. go the way of Gooby getting the shot down. But that won't stop Kanga continuing to. Uh, split push and siege themselves as a four man. They're really nicely done the game of chicken there with a the Sejuani stun and a Fiora riposte. Scooby just holds onto it, just holds onto it, waits for the riposte to come out, stuns him after and locks him down. So Blue will suffer his first death of the game. That will stop a lot of the advance that comes from this Baron buff, but ultimately they're still able to break an inner turret in bot lane. And so much of this map is now just open real estate for Kanga to work with for looking for future fights. Yeah, and the straight 5v5 right now is so hard. The tankiness coming out from the Casio and the Jarman. If you burn through them, you've got a Lulu and a Felios in the back line who are just doing... The DPS right now between Hooper and Dante isn't really... isn't even comparable, yeah. right? It's just stratospheres apart in terms of how much they're able to dish out here. We already see Tron resigned to going that Kempunk Chainsword second. He knows he's not really got too much more to offer in terms of that damage department. So now it's putting out fires for Ground Zero. Can you find those picks, right? Continual picks onto Blue, like Rusty said. It really can slow down the game and allow you to get some things back. It allow you to claim some territory. Yeah. Money into the pockets of Emphis as well. Money into the pockets of Dante. Those are the two members that you have to look at if you're a Ground Zero fan and just hope that they get the the money that's needed, the items that are needed to try and 1v9 a team fight. You know, Dante can play his range really well and can sit back and just throw those mystic shots out. Two items done for him. Probably going to need a third before he can really be considered. But this Aphelios, you can't really just poke him out. Well, I just saw the true shot barrage go across and the shield still stay strong. I yep. mean, that's how strong it is at this point of the game right now. An infinity edge as well. Three items complete. 23 minutes in. I mean, you're so unbelievably fed. You're too tanky with the shield. You've got the Gargoyle stone plate complete for the second game uh, in a row now for the uh, Cassiopeia. Not opting for the barrier this time, obviously, but still just by so, so much time. Yeah, every member on Kanga is a challenge in their own right to be able to take down, right? But as we look here back to Ground Zero, they are trying to retake some territory. They've moved Victor up to that top lane. A bit of a curious cataclysm, wasn't it? Onto the Sejuani, who just basic abilities out of it. 
Not really too phased whatsoever. I think Mayfang got jump scared. Yeah. <laughs> he just pressed every button that he possibly could, I guess. Uh, but look, it does mean the Cataclysm is not going to be available. Dante, you can see, moving towards the top side of the map. Has Bulldog behind him, but Blue with both the Q ability and the Ghost that he could pop if required uh, is very difficult to take down in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. Ground Zero realizing they cannot opt into a 5v5. They have to kill Blue. It's really their only option here. But as we see, this jungle is just so hard to walk into. That one control ward down towards that bottom wall behind the Gromp. Really the only deep vision they have. That's potentially fishing here. Arcane shift forwards. Looking for Fido, just weaves his way backwards into the waiting arms of Emphis. Now can he fight his way out of harm's way? Petrifying gaze onto the main threat, onto the Abrigo. Look at the shield! He's basically overhealed himself. That's a blood first to Cassiopeia if I've ever seen Teleport's one. Teleport's coming in. There's the TP. In comes Blue to flanking Fura now, staring down four members. Takes the challenge and says, Dante, you're dead. One man Moonlight Vigil onto Gooby. Maybe worst case scenario for him. But they've got a dragon to peel away to. And a lane with no kills to be found. Yeah, they just don't have enough damage to find any kind of follow-up kills. Fido presses Gargoyle Stoneplate. Can't die. Is able to walk away and gets the Lulu ultimate. Ground Zero. Still finding picks, but they can't translate picks into anything meaningful as Gooby. Needs to be very careful. Certainly does. Drone posturing on the flank right now, getting oh. closer to Mega. Dante, his fight's already gone, has to play from range now. Very safe from afar. Old skirmish. Ezreal ult comes through as well. Tron needs to take over to Mega right now. It's too late. Too little, too late. Fido's got the kill. The pot lane of Ground Zero is gone, and Kanga are retreating. Their damage has been done. Tron saw the angle there. That was so close to being a massive flash Meganar into the wall, but just didn't have the HP to survive to be able to get it off. Ground Zero, they are fighting. They are not going to let this game go quietly, but it just feels like they're clutching at straws. And, you know, even though they do find that one kill, you're right, Fido pops that Gargoyle Stoneplate, and Hooper wasn't even in that fight, right? He was over the wall the entire time. Having to invest that much to get one kill. But now we redeploy towards the Baron buff, right? 30 seconds until that is going to be up and available. A stopwatch done for Hooper as well beyond just those three items means it is very much impossible to kill both him and Fido who have an infinite number of shields that they can place on each other. Or for themselves, actually. And then you've got a Mikhail's Crucible as well there for Shinky. So Sejuani can't just be a sole engage anymore for the team. Denies that on everybody. Blue has Repost, Hooper has Cleanse. Look how disrespectfully Blue's able to play with no concerns oh, at all. Certainly is the case, and a Tibbers that uh, leaves a lot to be desired there as Baron for the second time has spawned, and it will be instantly looked at here. Chuck Tibbers in first to face check if you need. Tibbers is off with the fairies right now. Yubi has to sell for this. If they get Baron, this is game over. Let's try play Smite Simulator. What they does Gooby do here? Kanga, no. They just reset it. They don't really want to take the risk. They don't want the burger flip. It does feel like the only way that Kanga loses this game at this point, but Gooby jumps across the wall. Feels like he's found the target. Oh, no! Tron's missed it, and he's going to be punished for it. In goes the Cataclysm. Gooby forced a flash out of it this time, and a blue weapon that spreads damage, but not the one-shot tech just yet. No, and meanwhile, Blue is pushing up in this top lane. They're going to have to send someone to answer him. Gooby, no smite. It's not going to even be available for the steal attempt. So, a nice bait. Ground Zero tried to find the engage. They do the Sejuani ult out, but Tron just a bit too late to the play. And the second you mess up your engage, the second the Cassiope is able to throw that Miasma and Kai back, it's just game over. And now Baron in hand, the second one of the game. Kanga looking to close out this series. Here we go again. Let me watch this one more time. And quite simply, Kanga just say we're not going to take the risk. They're not going to go below 3k HP. They're going to walk towards mid lane, but Annie no Tibbers. And Tron doesn't want to go for the play as much as Gooby does. There's one target. It's Shinky. He is the last to move. But they're just not on the same page, not communicating on the same wavelength. And a very simple punish for the rest of Kanga here in response. And this comes back to exactly what we've been seeing from them in the rest of this game. Ground Zero aren't doing everything together as a team. The communication isn't fully there. And Kanga running away with it. And this must feel so frustrating for Ground Zero now. Denied their third game last night. So close to upsetting Chiefs in that upper bracket. Now in a lower bracket elimination game where you're thinking they've got that cohesion, but it's all lacking at the moment here, Max. You have to say that now. Look at Tron in the top side. As soon as that Mega times out, Kanga can basically push with no threat, right? The Sejuani ultimate doesn't matter. You've got Cleanse on Hooper. You have the Mikhail's Crucible available. 
So realistically, Ground Zero are going to have to look for something because the game doesn't get any better after you lose these two in hips. No flash on Hooper, no flash on Shinky. There are two targets there that can be killed. Fido, while he has no flash, basically cannot be killed. And they're just going to push them back. The bot inhibitor 100% going to fall. The question is, do they get the middle one as well? No Baron buff on the minions just yet. But no carry to clear the wave. It's the whole break of Fiora, but grouped up together, they will guarantee that the first inhibitor falls in that bot lane now. An exposed inhibitor in the second portion, be it the mid lane. He's being looked at. Tron does have Flash, does have Mega, but gets locked in place by Mayas. Mr. can't play the game again. Now stop by the petrifying gaze! Three times in a row! They need the Nar to be impactful, it just cannot be made. In with the Flash EQ, knock up onto Victor. Stop watch the nice to kill for the meantime. But this is Kanga looking to try to end the game right now. Fido burning. So lucky with the amount of shields that he has. The lifeline doing wonders. Mayfod also with a shield of his own. Hooper's the agent untouched. is doing what it can. Shinky and Hooper are putting in absolute work. And a flash forward to say it's my time to be 10-0. Kanga say draft be damned. We are going to pick what we're good at. We are going to pick what we know. And they are going to reverse sweep the series. You mentioned it, Skimmy, it feels bad for Ground Zero, but boy did Kanga fight, boy did Kanga turn it around from what we've seen from them all split and have taken their first series in this lower bracket. Ground Zero, the team that beat the Chiefs and now unfortunately lose to Kanga, who definitely came into their own in the second game. And I think you've just seen what momentum can do for a squad in a best of series and why a best of three is an entirely different ball game to the best of ones. Insane. Insane game. Look, GZ, as you mentioned, just caught out of position one too many times. And it felt like it was just a, a battle that Kanga brought their A game to and GZ didn't. That's that's essentially what it was. And GZ will be the first team knocked out of the group stage here in the LCO, which is so devastating to think about, Con you know, contemplating the story from yesterday as well, where they managed to take a map off of the Chiefs. Looks like they were on track to take the Chiefs down. But now they're here and they're gone. And Kanga, look, what a turnaround. Like, they didn't look very good in their first game. They didn't look very good in the first game today either. But then second game, started to turn it around. Third game, did enough to win. Looked pretty damn good doing it. And the macro, the shot calling, the decision making, mm -hmm. it was really, really solid towards the end of parts. They just picked their own champions, mate. They just picked exactly what they wanted to play. They said, your comp be damned. It doesn't matter to us. Play what we're going to play comfort. We're going to play what we're good at. And we're going to pick on Emphas. That, yeah. was, that was the one strategy beyond draft that I think was abundantly clear is when pressured, Emphas was definitely struggling in this series. I think they found that vulnerability in the second game after having witnessed how strong he was in game one in the Annie. The impact was left to be desired, right? So the fact that in the third game, they will just double down on that. And I think... Yeah, just such a roller coaster of emotions for uh, for Grand Zero in the last 24 hours. Mm. The other thing as well that I wanted to touch on, uh, Rusty, was it? It was you that asked Max, "Is Aphelios viable? Is that around as an ADC pick at the moment?" And Max was like, "Nah, you wouldn't." That happened, right? Yeah, oh, pre pre show. Pre, pre, yeah, we had pre, a conversation pre about Aphelios pre show. Yeah, no, wasn't that pre draft? I thought that was it on the was. couch. It was here yeah. on the couch before this game. Oh, we had it twice then. Yeah. Oh, there, <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. Either way, uh, Hooper said yes. Screw your opinion, Max. I'm playing it. And he looked really damn good on the Aphelios as well. Was that clean? That was. 8-0 and 3, maybe even more. It he finished it was 10 10-0. 10-zip. 10 and Insanity. This, and this is what was strange to me, right, is that this is an elimination game. You've had Dante carry games basically by himself as a, on hyper carries the entire split long. Yeah. And you chuck him on Ezreal for the last game, right? It sort of seems a bit out of character for what Ground Zero typically play towards. And, you know, we mentioned the Aphelios not being a meta, that meta of a pick, but against an Ezreal, it has a free lane. You've got a Lulu behind it, and we all know what Hooper can do when he's able to scale up and get into these late-game team fights. And yeah, just really sucks for Ground Zero, you know, not able to find the momentum after that first game. I think that second game domination really threw them off. Can I just say, Hooper must just be like a high-pressure player, only playing his best games when he really needs to. That's what happened over in the group, in the round robin rather, you know, towards the end of the split, and now it's happening here again. He puts enough pressure on himself, mate, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. What's the high pressure game for him? It's just another day in the office. Everyone else feels the pressure as they start to elevate their heart rate. He's just in his lane. Yeah. Always been there. Some insane amount of pressure to create diamonds like Hooper, and he's doing it again. Look, top lane as well, blue. He, he didn't, did he end up getting a kill? I don't know if he did. Either way, just the pressure that he was exerting on that top lane was so hard for Tron to deal with. And then Tron just getting so unlucky with the timings of his ults, 
just barely getting out of position. And as you mentioned, the cogs just not turning together for GZ today. Yeah, just triple alts, triple opportunities um, where it was just completely denied, right? Be it the Cataclysm or the CC of their own or the Miasma. I mean, that Cataclysm, uh, rather the Cassio Pier, just proving to be too devastating on too many different fronts. Mm. Be it the Engage of the um, of the Nile or just the Vector, just taking a little bit too much, you almost say greed, but holding a little bit too much restraint on whether I flash the Cataclysm initially or if I greed and hope that, hey, Cataclysm into Miasma, well, I'm, I'm basically stuck now. So, um, yeah, I think Blue can look at this one and say, hey, you let the Fiora go through. Uh, we've denied the Zeri, so we've sort of got our carry condition. We've denied yours from Dante. Mm -hmm. And look, before you say okay, anything, sorry. save that question. For a very excited individual, we have Hooper on the line to have a quick chit chat Hello. to. Mate, how are you feeling? You got a big smile? Yeah, happy with that one? Yeah, I'm feeling happy right now. Really, really happy. Okay, well, you guys <laughs> really turned it around after game one. It almost seemed like you guys were basically out of it. What were you guys saying backstage, and particularly in that third game where your draft was basically just pick whatever you want, um, pick whatever you're comfortable on, and you especially had a blinder of a performance? Oh, uh, yeah. So after we lost the first game, so my coach said, uh, actually, we, you guys can play whatever you want, like just chill. And then, then after that, we won game two, game three. And then we keep repeating that, like, we are pretty chill. We're not, we're not getting any, like, like any heart or anything after lost game one, but we're, we're looking at team pretty good. And then, we won the game. Best of three today. Was Fido happy to be back on the cast as well? We we threw that up as maybe an option when we were talking about draft here on the couch. But was he just, you know, super comfortable on it? I feel like every time Fido was playing really well uh, in Kanga last split before you guys joined the team as well was when he was allowed to play cast. So was it just the comfort picks that allowed you guys to chill out and get this win today? Um, I don't know. Like second game, he picked Castopia, but I think he's going to bat them out. But I don't know, JZ, like JZ, ego him or something, but he didn't, they didn't pan Kasobia out. So, so after, after we, we pick Kasobia, he laughed pretty much. So like, um, also Jeremy say, oh, we're going to win this game, guys, 100%. Like, like my team really confident after Fido pick um, Kasobia. Yeah, you guys did seem pretty confident. Now, looking ahead, you guys are going to play the loser of Bliss and Chiefs. I want to get your thoughts on that matchup. Who do you think is going to take it? And who would you prefer to play against in your next best of three? Sorry, what was the question? Who would you rather play against out of Bliss and Chiefs? And who do you think is going to win? Oh, I think if, to be honest, I think Chief's going to beat Bliss. Okay, so... Pretty you, much like 2 out straight 2 -0. But preferentially, would you prefer to play Bliss oh, again or I, Chiefs? I prefer... Oh, I prefer play Bliss with Chief. I think Chief. Uh, easier than the place to be honest. What a world, okay. bro. Things have changed. Things have changed since like six months ago, right? Now, look, on that note, Hooper, we're going to let you go enjoy the win. Uh, chill out with the boys. And look, congratulations. We'll see you next week for another game. Yep. See you guys. Have a good night. What gap? What gap? What gap? What gap? <laughs> <laughs> love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, so, Hooper, much happier this time oh. than that win against Chiefs uh, from. The Rand Robin stage. Can't be upset at himself with a 10 0 scoreline, oh. Kenny. So it's good to see Hooper happy. Also, dropping some anime references in there. So, <laughs> well, is that what that was? Yeah, yeah. Right. He's a happy man. So, what was it? Was this? Was it? Chainsaw Man reference. Ah, okay. It looks not up to date on the matter. Uh, but I am up to date with Dare MVPs. Do you want to see who the Dare MVP was? I do. Go I'd be then. I'd be pretty frazzled if it wasn't that man on your screen. Let's see who Twitch chat voted in here. It was Fido. Okay. Yep. 12 4 and 21. That is a big score and 67% KP and a decent amount of the damage share, but of course calling and then just always in the right place at the right time for the second two games. I think he's definitely the spiritual leader of Kanga. I think as soon as you see that Casio and Hooper mentioned it, right? As soon as I got that Casio, Blue was like, yeah, we've won the game, right? And it almost feels like that. You have that pillar of stability in the mid lane that you know is going to be able to perform. And that really spans out. Everyone sort of can feel like they can relax mm. because you have Fido there. You have that late game insurance policy. And I'm so glad we saw that today because I was hoping that Fido would be able to showcase his experience into Emphis, right? I was thinking, you've seen Dante and Bulldog firing on all cylinders. You're seeing that Tron is in the form of his life as well, getting the Olaf, getting these cheesy, not cheesy, but able to play the tanks like a carry. You're thinking there has to be at least one lane of stability. Game one, yes, you ratted off. The Annie tax was paid. It was pressured. It was great. But then... From game two and three onwards, it was like, I've been around a lot longer than you, uh, and I'm going to show you what that means. Look, there was a there was a lot of fights today. There was a lot of team fights. Yeah, don't Bloody ask. everywhere. You don't want to ask? I got no answer. No, no answer? Okay, right, we'll play of the day. Here it is. Let's see which of the...
3,000 fights that we had today I I in be. three games. Oh, no. Oh, wait, is this the play of the day? No. <laughs> oh, no <laughs> this was, this no. was unironically the play of the day. You know when we give people MVP and you discuss the concept of value, you could argue this was the most valuable headbutt in the history of the LCO. Yeah, yeah. but like for the wrong, for the wrong well, yeah. reason. Yeah. 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 But that's one of those plays that you watch back as Bulldog and you think and you, you overthink and you're like, did this cost us like the entire series? And in this case, it might have. Well, the LCO production team is giving him nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> We're playing it again. <laughs> this, this is, what, oh. the fourth time that it's been shown on air? Delete the VOD. That poor guy. Into a Wombo combo. Oh. Three. The man and his mullet are in shambles. Oh, he's got to get that shaved off now. Does he? Maybe, maybe it was mullet death. I don't know. I know, I'm clutching at straws. I just you want, really are. <laughs> I really want Dre to feel better because no doubt you're looking at the stream now and you want to all be you know happy and jovial like he was in his interview. But yeah, no doubt going to be a little bit. Of no, a I reckon feel. after a game like that, it's a stream off, computer off, have a big sip of water, grass touch, touch grass, or go to sleep. Just maybe wake up to the tomorrow. Gym. Wake up tomorrow, you'll yeah. feel better. Off to the gym, maybe. Hit the gym. Oh, is he a late gymmer? I, I don't know. He's but a gamer. He is a gymmer. That's true. That's so true. But look, let's have a look at the bracket now after the first week of the group stage is all done and dusted. And we've said goodbye to our first team, which is GZ. They're out there in the lower bracket round one, the only thing to be filled in for today. Uh, but then moving forward means it's going to be Kanga to potentially get a rematch against Team Bliss if they lose against the Chiefs or the Chiefs if Team Bliss play out of their mind and Chiefs win. I think it was really interesting that Hooper said that he thinks Chiefs are going to win, but he'd rather play Chiefs. versus the Chiefs. Yeah. yeah. I think that just is a testament to the way that Team Bliss approach the game. Yes. And that it's, they're just so non-standard that teams really don't want to be bothered preparing against them. You've heard it in multiple interviews now as well, right? They're just so tough to deal with. Their mid-jungle duo is just so sporadic and unpredictable. And we're also looking at two potential groups here, Mac. Two potential brackets yep. of the lower bracket and upper bracket rematch being the exact same. Yeah, there, there is a very, very large chance that that is going to happen. Of course, that upper bracket game is not only for, you know, bragging rights. It is going to be that qualification game next Monday. That's, you know, winner of that goes straight into the LCO playoffs. They qualify for playoffs. They've, they, of course, have to play that seeding game eventually. What a day. And Ooh. yeah, big games, big games. Upper bracket uh, finals, early finals. I don't know what you'd call it. Uh, but at the same time, yeah, we'll call them prelims. Woo! I, don't, I just like terms of Yeah, it's a good word, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> either way, look, Die Walls and PGG to kick things off at 5 p.m. Another early start there. And then 8 p.m. for that TB against Chiefs game. Uh, of course, I believe it'll be not start before. So obviously, we're not going to start that 5 p.m. game at 4 p.m. And we're not going to start that 8 p.m. game at 6 p.m. if the first one's a blinder. Honestly, things to note is a brand new patch, 13.4. Aurelian oh, Soul will be enabled. Die Wolves have been lurking in the shadows, watching all these games unfold and saying, really, what is the narrative? Who are we most afraid of? So it's a Brisbane battle. It is a battle in Brisbane. Brisbane battle. Again, and, um, they, can they land next to each other for the oh, best I would <laughs> love. I would hope so. Surely. Yes. Make it happen, guys. Come on. I know you're all listening. I know you're all excited. They, what was, didn't like Sav and the Bliss guy have There's like a tattoo bet. Tattoo tattoo. There is a tattoo oh, bet. Brandy uh, sent a vector of the image to the Chiefs after their loss yesterday. Here you go, mate. <laughs> it's like, just so you know, this is how the, this is what the tattoo is going to look like. <laughs> wow. So there, yeah, there's some banter going back and forth between them. Oh. Interesting, huh? That, that's going to be a fun one. Uh, just follow that storyline. But also, look, that brings us towards the end of the day. But before the day's done, we have a quick chinwag session with our good friend Voice coming in from Mammoth because they didn't get to play today. They got the bye. Voice, mate, how you feeling? Did you watch that game? Did you like it? Yeah, I watched the game. I watched uh, Mayfun <laughs> absolutely piss Murph on everyone on the other team. Have 100% KP for most of the game. Uh, He's the GOAT for a reason. Hey, there you go. So, ex-teammates, of course, you're proud of him. Uh, are, you, are you proud of you guys' uh, Mammoth's performance at the moment? Obviously, you had the rest of the week off, so you're able to sit back on the sidelines, watch these games, figure out what you guys want to do, potentially, if you get that rematch against PGG or, of course, you know, going up against Direwolves. Are you practicing? Are you getting ready for that? Um, honestly, we've been kind of lost, uh, especially on these new patches, because we've been having scheduling issues pretty much the entire split. It's really hard for us to get, like, practice with all five of the players, and it's really hard for us to all find stuff that we're all comfortable on. 
So it's quite hard for us to play some scrim sets with one player who has this champion and then another scrim set with another player who has other champions. And so our drafts kind of look really like incohesive or kind of hard for us to execute because we're all just trying to play what we feel is best in the moment, which kind of isn't the best, especially when other teammates need to know how to play around those sort of champions. So I think being able to watch some teams play in the LCO especially will give us some good perspective. And going into next week when we have a rematch, we'll have a lot better idea of what we can play and it's honestly just kind of more copying the other teams rather than trying to be innovative ourselves since we don't have a lot of time so yeah well look arguably kanga just played their comfort champs played whatever the hell they wanted and they beat <laughs> ground zero and saved themselves so maybe that's something to think about yeah you said rematch so do you think it will be a rematch do you think you guys will be playing against pgg again bro i have no idea both of those teams <laughs> don't like, I don't know, both of those teams are kind of cracked, so like, whichever team wins is the team will play against, but uh, I think PGG playing against them, I think their laning across the board is really, really strong. I think they have a really good idea of how they want to play the game. They didn't particularly try and beat us quickly or beat us at a speed that was like, oh, this team is shit, we'll just beat them really fast. They definitely tried to play the game properly, closed it out well against us, rather than just trying to roll all of our lanes. They were playing the game properly, and I think if they maintain that form, they'll probably win the split to be completely honest okay well high praise there for pgg that being yeah. said what are you guys doing back there at mammoth to give yourselves the best chance of you know taking a game taking a series away from either pgg or direwolves um we are just trying to scrim whenever we can pretty much which like whenever all of us are available we are trying to scrim the best we can and when we do scrim we're trying to do as little like random scrims i guess you know that scrim where somebody just wants to try out a random champion and it just doesn't work we're trying to avoid doing those and make sure our practice is as valuable as possible so then when we get onto stage we're all comfortable in what we're playing and we're all willing to play what we actually want to play because in some of our drafts we're very much last minute in draft like oh shit, what do we pick here guys or like oh i don't know what to play uh and that's obviously really really bad coming into game day because maybe the rest of your team doesn't know how to play or you don't even know how to play the champion properly so we're really trying to make our scrims on set champions and on those champions who we are going to play on the stage. And we think that's how we're going to have more success. Yeah, look, Voice, it seems like you guys, unfortunately, with those scheduling issues, are still doing your best job. And that's exactly what we love to hear. But on that note, look, we'll let you enjoy the rest of your week, your weekend, everything else you got going on. And we'll see you next week for a banger. Thanks, sir. Sir. Thank sir, you, hey. sir. True. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking old. I must be looking old today. Like, that's all I think when someone says sir. It's like, <laughs> oh, all right. I get the respect aspect. But don't make me feel like a bloody adult. I'm not an adult. I, I, am are, an, I am an adult. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> you're paying your taxes, mate. You're an adult. Yeah. <laughs> I hate it. Look, uh, look. either way, let's move forward. <laughs> yep. <Don't laughs> I was about. like, how many knee slaps have we got here? <laughs> hey, knee slaps? Dream back? No, from the fans. That's what we're going to be talking about right now. Uh, of course, it's from some handsome individual. Oh. What's oh. this? Uh, best skin, best chroma. Yeah, that is. That's um, the Nocturne, <laughs> uh, Nocturne skin. Yep. Um, Do you know what cool. it's called? The Nocturne skin. You posted this. It's something with Brightwood? Darkwood? No. Alder, Alderwood? Elder. Elderwood? Elderwood Black Chroma? Is that's that the one. This is? Yeah, Black Chroma. Yeah, that's the one I use. It's really cool. Um, cool. Oh, hashtag LCO, at LCO. What's the resume say? Uh, we love LCO. Also, exclamation dream hack to get tickets so we can discuss why I'm right and why you're wrong in person. On the 29th of April, thank you. Oh, this guy seems to know exactly what's going down. Mm, that's yeah. crazy. What yeah. a sick from the fans, huh? You should go follow that guy on Twitter. That's <clears> a super <throat> fan. Get him the 4,000 followers. <clears throat> Shameless. Shameless. Hey, look. You got a uh, kitty's on a hundred thousand at the moment. So yeah, I'm falling, I'm falling behind. Yeah, kitty is the queen. <laughs> yep. She absolutely ratios us all. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, she speaks. We listen. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Uh, look, either way, um, that is it for us at the moment. Make sure you get that exclamation dream hack in. Go buy those tickets to the Saturday or the whole damn weekend because we love esports. We love dream hack, and I love you. We love menu log too. That's coming up just after the break. Menu log meal time. We'll see you in just a minute.
menu log meal time here on the LCO. <laughs> and to kick things off, what? The steez on this man, I'm just, god I'm just damn. I'm going to the off the camera. It was powerful. These Can't male models, broke why, why am I surrounded by oh, male models I was models getting here? a little bit excited for a second. Completely ridiculous, I'm jealous. <laughs> uh, look, I just want to do a bit of acting before we jump on into it. You guys, your, you know your job. Type in menu pog, get that $40 voucher, get yourself something scrumptious on menu log with the voucher and everyone's happy. Uh, Australia only. I'm lucky, everyone else. But look, you can, you can still type it. <laughs> you just can't use it. Uh, look, we're going to quickly group activity. Mm -hmm. We're going to do like hand signals to do menu. Right, okay. And then log in an exclamation mark. So I'm in. How do I make it E, bro? M. E. Yeah, or? you got to work out N. N. Get oh. it, Skimmy. Get it. We can stand if you want. Mate, my leg. Ah! I can do this for an M. No, I can't, I can't do the standing. M. I've e got N. It. U. Okay, now log an exclamation mark. Uh, L. O. Skimmy, I... you're a G. Skimmy, you're a G. Just, just, just do act that. like yourself. <laughs> just do that. Is that a... <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you do exclamation mark? Yeah, well, I, I, I reckon that's past. I reckon that's, that's oh, bang. Man. Uh, and the other I thing is really well. low-rolled Look. my options. Speaking <laughs> 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 Wow. Just in the wrong seat. Uh, by the way, Look, we love snacks. And we love people who are uh, male models by trade, like Maximize here. So when you're on set on a photo <gasps> shoot... What? Where is that camera? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh, it's that one. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah. Uh, when you're on set <laughs> for these photo shoots... What's your favourite snack? What, what, yeah, do you, what favorite would you snack? like to be there or ordered from menu log to keep you, keep you, you know, not peckish? You know those pea nature hub? I don't know what they're exactly yes. called, but the dried out peas? Yes. They're fantastic. Yes. Better than potato chips. Dried out peas? Actually fast. Yeah, they're harvest really snaps good is what they're called. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're flavoured. They're not just, you're not just eating peas. Yeah, salt and vinegar yeah. is my go-to. Yep. Okay, salt and vinegar, vinegar peas. Yep. Salt and vinegar okay, dried bro, peas. Try it. Yeah. Try yeah. it first. They are good. They are good. Genuinely, on paper. the best. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what is my go-to snack? Uh-huh. Probably sugar, to be honest. Photo sugar. Shoots, sugar. Probably just sugar. I <laughs> mean, so look at me, mate. Sugar. Sugar. I, am, I am the smallest man in this building on this couch right now. I'm not bulky. I'm not cutting. All I'm eating is junk food, mate. Were you watching yesterday when he came up with the salami shit? No. Do oh. you, you have a charcuterie board of just salami, and your snack is just a bowl of sugar? <laughs> You can no, because like okay, so I remember I came around for your shamed. birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I came around for your birthday, and you got the the um, got the, <laughs> the Maltese packet open. I'm just on. Oh, oh Maltese. Oh, I'm yeah. just I'm just yeah. casually Maltesers. grab yeah. yarn, so grab you, yarn. You'd be scared in the kitchen, wouldn't you? That kitchen is a nightmare, mate. Yeah. You see all the sugar in there. Far oh. out. Oh heaven. Yeah, I'll be looking at it. Uh, Rusty, it. what about you? What's your male model photo shoot snack of choice? <laughs> oh, man. I, I like slow-burning snacks, so like the muesli bars and, and whatnot. So I'm a big fan of even like the you throw back to like a K-time bar. Mm. Oh, oh, the K-time yeah, yeah. twist? Yeah, yeah, the twist. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Lunchbox staple. Okay. Bananas. Boons. Bananas. Yeah, bananas good. Just bananas. Love them. You Boons were waiting to drop that. They're good. Yeah, I was. Bananas. 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 Did you ever watch the show as a kid, Mac? Bananas and pajamas. I'm a banana. Bang a show, by the way. That angle really does it. The... <laughs> yeah. Really does anyway, help. this is his face. I'm a banana. That is. Look at me. What is going on? I'm a banana. I. Hey, I. Yeah. Looks like you're Michael Phelps, mate. Preparing for the dive into the Olympic pool. <laughs> How long is this cable? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to swim. <laughs> That's gone. That's gone. Save me. <laughs> oh, it's a <laughs> lifesaver. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, shenanigans. Uh, what's your favourite snack to have on a boat before you actually fall off the boat and need to get saved? I know it's bad to eat before swimming, but Ooh. you didn't mean to fall off the boat. So if you were just there having like a good time with your friends on a boat, what's your favourite snack? I'll go. Yep. The snack. You know the little cheese <laughs> dipper bits? <laughs> really? I actually, when I was okay. we're fishing, I went fishing with my granddad as a kid, and we used them as bait. And he I, th I think he told me I caught something, so I believed him. So now I just believe that that's like the best thing to use whenever you go fishing uh, as bait. That's insane. Snack. Like, like the fake cheese. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Fish must love it. <laughs> they must. Either way, look, you guys can think about it. I'll give you the weekend. Are fish, right. can fish be lactose intolerant? <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> Bro, 
Do you what? think fish? We're going, we're going down a hole. Do you think fish are like, yo, where's that oat milk at though? Yeah, fish where's that ate that cheese and was like, nah, that ain't me. That fish is just literally down the ocean like, guts full, mate. Goes back to the hive and like, don't go up there, mate. The hive? Oh, you know. I think this Where is a great time for yeah. everyone <laughs> to take hives? those menu log codes. What? Down, buy yourself down in the ocean, mate. some dessert and have a long, hard think Holy about why moly. you should never work in esports. <laughs> All right, think about that. Uh, as we close the show, thank you for joining us for Menu Log Meal Time. That's it for the first week of groups. We've got another week to get through and to get. Then we've got to get to the weekend. We'll see you after it. <laughs> now, break the mid lane out of turret as a result, as well as getting that second Drake. Hello. It's a big pull, so double TP to come on in. Look at Mayfun finding his target. Flash ult onto Zeri. You've got no flash, you've got no chance. Out for the tendrils to kick away. Dante's lives somehow. Ice getting his way to victory. It's his team corral around and say, don't worry, mate, oh, we'll no. get it done. Look at Tron. That was so, so dirty as they get the full ace. 5v5, five look, five, look at Infus on the flank, has a flash. Looking for a blue, and he finds it. Stun, oh. one shot. I mean, good night. It's a little bit too easy for them. Hooper now, the next one to focus on, Dan. And he's in so much trouble. Dante flashing on his head, a wish, a dream, and a potential outplay. Look how much healing there is. But in the flash ward again from Infus, and he's just getting it done. He's removed two carries. His job is complete. And when you watch this kick off Fido, no flash. So they put a big target on his head. They say this is what we're after, but the reinforcements are so far. And Fido bucks the trend, goes aggressive, gets the stun onto Dante and just survives. He is so tanky. And that's all you need, time. Hooper gets in, time was on their side. He's able to get all of the kills here and a nice little flag drag flash knockup makes sure that there's no flash from Emphis. And then Hooper